Uh, very good morning to all of you, um, dignitaries and invited speakers and all the participants. So I'm very happy and it gives me an immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Mrudul Mandal. So he's from Bangladesh. His journey starts from Bangladesh to Japan, Japan to US, and now he's settled in US. Presently, he is working as the marketing manager in the pharma, biopharma division for America, both Latin America and North America at Shimaju Scientific Instruments, Maryland, USA. And do, when I contacted him, uh, requesting him for the you know, talk, so he was actually in the transition. He was moving from uh, Boston Analytical to Shimaju. So right now, actually, he is staying in the um, hotel um, from where, I, uh, because he's uh, busy, but still he agreed and he accepted our invitation. And I'm very thankful to him. He is founder, CEO, and chief strategist in Mandalaji. And he worked as senior scientist in Boston Analytical, New Haven. USA, and he also worked as staff scientist for Europeans. And he did this postdoctoral re research at University of Mysore, Burlington, where I met him. Guest scientist at the University of Magdeburg, Germany, and he graduated from University of Lübeck, Germany with biomedical engineering degree. And he did his PhD in, uh, from uh, University of Yamanshi, Japan, and he is also recipient of a doctoral fellowship offered by Japan. And he is right now is pursuing MBA from University of Massachusetts. Look at that. So even after achieving in his life and he is having job, but still he is, you know, thirst of knowledge and education. So that shows. It's a, it can be a role model for many of us. And he's honored with above and beyond 2018 award by Europeans. He has received several fellowships and scholarships and also grant in aid for his research. And he has published around 35 research articles in peer reviewed, reputed journals. And also he has authored one book chapter. And he is also having his own YouTube channel where he frequently, he actually um, uploads uh, videos motivating uh, students, young minds. So it is a great honor for me to introduce and welcome Dr. Mrudul Mandal uh, to render his um, invited talk. Thank you so much for accepting Mrudul. Uh, now you can uh, share your PPT and start with your lecture. Thank you. Once when you are sharing, please switch on that sound. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shidesha and uh, all the committee for inviting me. Uh, it is um, such a great honor for me. And uh, I'm highly, uh, highly pleased that um, you, are, you, are, you have invited me. And uh, the talk, today's talk will be the global career opportunities for biological science and uh, related fields. Since uh, I was electrical engineer and uh, my journey from electrical engineering uh, I moved to biomedical and then bioanalytical chemistry. Finally, um, I'm going to move to the business world. And this is the journey how I did and why I changed that I'm going to share with you. So the talk entitled um, in the different parts, uh, I, the title is the global uh, career opportunities. But before that, I want to introduce a little bit about myself 
then I have a um, Facebook page and YouTube channel where I regularly try to put something. And out of that, I'll show you one video that is seven strategy uh, to make a great career. And then I will show you how to get a job in the industry, especially US and European market, uh, or even globally. And then I try to summarize top 10 master plans for global career, especially for students uh, who are eager to join in a global family, because we all are basically entire world is ours. And uh, we can uh, work from any place to anywhere. So why uh, firing and getting fired also important to grow. So let's get started. So here, all about me, I was born and raised in a very poor farming family in Bangladesh. I am the first person in my family that have high school degree. And then uh, I broke the stereotype and moved to the uh, higher education. Uh, so uh, after getting admission is the Bangladesh Institute of Technology. They just changed the name recently. Uh, in electrical engineering, after finishing electrical engineering, I work as a sales and service engineer. And while working one day, a 10 years boy died because I couldn't arrive that place in time uh, due to the limitation of the car. So they didn't allow me to come back because they told me to stay uh, two more days. At that time, I was offered one of the largest telecom company job. So I couldn't join and I was very upset. So then I went to a cyber cafe and looking for something else. So I applied uh, two positions uh, in Germany uh, for biomedical engineering and electrical engineering. Uh, so the masters and I got both, both of them and without a scholarship, I moved to Germany. And while working as a restaurant in the daytime, whenever I have uh, free time at night or day, it doesn't matter, I was working. And then I finished my masters after finishing that master's, I got PhD admission in one of the university. And I saw that professor was uh, hiring students to obtain. So one of the Indian students, all of the students from Ukraine uh, were, were fired. And then one student uh, left. And then I didn't know what to do. So that's why I moved to Japan. And after moving to Japan, I got a Monbu Kagakusha scholarship uh, during my PhD. And they shortened my PhD. Uh, to make me faculty. But that time there was severe earthquake and in 2011, I saw that the position collapsed. And then I got JSPS fellowship at that time to do the postdoc. Uh, but I, I was not happy with the language and other things. So that, that's why I moved to United States. And my postdoc was uh, University of Notre Dame, my first postdoc, where, where the postdoc was collapsed within one year. And I had to walk um, in an icy road about uh, five miles every day. It was minus 30 degrees Celsius. And after eight months, I suddenly know that my, I have only four months left. So I started applying and I got a postdoc with the path to become faculty at the University of Vermont. And I went there. But after, after working one and a half year, again, the money collapsed and they wanted to give me a technician kind of position, which is a staff scientist or research scientist only a technical job, not the faculty. So I moved to the industry and then I moved to the academia again. But while uh, moving <clears throat> to the academia, uh, I found that they, they, they gave me the temporary stay in a very bad hotel and always having issue with the money. So then I, I thought it's enough, is enough. So I, I left academia and moved to the industry completely. While working in the industry, I found the business people always try to suppress the science and other people. So I thought it's, it's a time to move to the corporate ladder that I could have chance to uh, dominate the corporate world. And that I start learning all those uh, business educations from business schools. And uh, like Harvard Business School, I did many courses. And then uh, that encouraged me to get the MBA degree. So now I have been pursuing MBA. So and my life in USA now settled almost. I have a big house in Salem, New Hampshire. It's close to Boston. But now I have to sell that house to move to the Maryland because I have my new job in Maryland as a marketing manager uh, of one of the largest analytical instrument company. So I'll take care about two, two America's market to sell that equipment and find the market. So 
marketing doesn't mean that is the out of science. It's a technical marketing. It requires somebody has a highly skilled of uh, science and, and combine the business. So it's a blend. Somebody has a blend with the uh, science and business can get this kind of position only. So here, uh, this is my Facebook page where I try to encourage many students and occasionally I did many talks in Bengali also in Bangladesh with the, some of the university and as with some other people. So where I try to put why you need to do um, in academic research, why you need to move to the industry, those kind of things. And beyond that um, Facebook page, I have a YouTube channel where I try to put a um, lot of videos, but due to the uh, my night time, I have to study a lot. MBA is not a joke, it's too much study. Especially, I, I, I did PhD, I know, and in, in a global market. Uh, so the M MBA is beyond that, it, it has a lot of assignments. So because of that, and also searching jobs uh, from science to industry, it took um, me a lot of times every day. Uh, so that's why I couldn't put a lot of videos, but in future I have planned uh, to put videos so that people from uh, India, Bangladesh, or many other countries can come to US and Europe and make a great career. So there, therefore, I want to share one of the videos from YouTube and you will know that what, what my, uh, my brand is and how I am going to that, that way. So seven is strategy to make a great career. This is Dr. Medul Mandel. And I will tell you what are those seven strategies and how you can make it. First, learn early what you want to do in your life. The reason I am saying it's better to fail in early life than in the later stage of life. Like you see the drug industry, if the drug fails in early, it costs a couple of hundred thousand dollars. If a drug fails in a later stage like phase three, it costs about 1.5 billion dollars. So there, what I give this example, let me tell you one story. Two PhD students, after finishing their PhD, one went to postdoc and then research assistant professor, associate professor. He has spent 10 years, and these 10 years, his average salary was 50,000, and he was getting in hand 35,000 after reducing all those things like insurance. And the other guy, he went to industry, and he started a career, not so high salary, but his 10 year salary was like average 100,000 per year. He was getting about $70,000, Per year, you can see the difference is about thirty-five thousand. So in ten years, it's three hundred fifty thousand dollar. By three hundred fifty thousand dollar, you can buy a house in many states in America. That means you are losing a house if you do a ten-year postdoc or postdoc-like position. So decide early what you want to do in your life. Second strategy: stop complaining to others. I saw in my life many students. PhD students, postdoctoral students, they always complaining. Oh, their boss is not giving the position, not giving the enough money, not helping to move to the another job or industry. I also saw in industry, many guys are complaining. But instead, you think about positively. Because of that professor, you are in that lab. You came to US or Europe to have a standing career. So thank him. And then this when you are suffering, I am 100% sure positive thing will come if you stay positive. Now the third strategy, you have to invest on yourself. What I mean by that? Investing means investing time and money. Time means many, many lab, many positions, or if you are earliest in your career, incorporate with a bachelor degree or whatever degree, you might have PhD, but you know, you may need to spend a lot of time on the lab or on the job you are doing. It could be in academia, it could be in industry. But if you don't take out some time to invest on yourself to improve your skills, then it is hard to get a job. Or if you take some time, enjoy with your family or yourself, your partners, whatever you have, for whomever you have. So you have to enjoy. So the reason I am telling you invest some money 
for example new techniques you have to learn new skills you have to learn and if you are in STEM, you have to take evening class if you want to move to the next level of your career. So that could be management, marketing, accounting, finance, that will really help you to move to the next level. From today, you will start investing your time and money on yourself. That will give you really big position in future. And then fourth strategy, don't let anybody to decide for you. The reason I am saying is very simple. If you cannot take decision by yourself and if you are blaming that he didn't help you, she didn't help you or something like that, it will not help you. In industry, there are many serious decisions you have to make as you grow in your career. Therefore, it's very important you start decide for yourself and learn what position and what things you want for your life. Take this strategy, build your network. If you see the 21st century, economy is developed by the networking if you want to go to job in academia or industry you have to build a network you have a lot of publication in academia but you don't know the top professor you don't know who decide for the proposals who give the funding you will not get fund you have to build a very strong network with the top professional and work hard to the standing science or whatever you do whatever great science it doesn't matter unless you build a strong network therefore from today you will start build a network if you want to move from industry to academia or academia to industry it's it will be very easy to move by here and there therefore build a solid network that will help you to move to the next level and Sixth strategy, many of the scientists, engineers are lacking of that. That is how to talk, how to negotiate, and how to sell. The reason I am selling how to sell, very important that you know how to sell yourself. Because even though you are going to find a job, that means you want to sell yourself what about the good thing you can bring to that company, and then they will give the job. Another thing I tell you, how to negotiate and for negotiating you need to learn how to talk and if you cannot talk effectively and you use a lot of jargons and the people who talk more they don't have idea what they are talking about that's why you need to learn effectively talking and then negotiate means that in average employee in america lost ten thousand dollar per year because of the lack of negotiation skills in america or europe Allies recruiter want to give you job with less salary possible. That's why you have to talk effectively and learn how to negotiate. That will give you enough salary. That means if you lost $10,000 every year that you are in 10 years, you are losing 100000 If your position is high, like CEO or close to that position, that means you are losing even more. My final strategy, never ever settle in a job. What I mean by that? That means today's economy you saw, the pandemic made a catastrophic effect. Many people lost job, many people got fired, many people got laid off. So what they have to do after losing the job? If you have a good skills, you are learning every day, you can move to another job. For example, you fall in love in a job and what happened, the company stopped loving you you have to find another position and also you are a scientist or you are an engineer or you are a marketing guy you might got a director or higher role so you have to move to that position that's why I never get set up for example you are a position like you are a STEM professor or associate professor but another university want to give you full professor so you move there and then you move but after a couple of years you, another university want to give you dean position so you should move there my friend, our life itself is not settled here until we die and make to the cosmic oceans. Therefore, never get settled. So that's, that was the, one of the videos that I showed. Um, out of that, um, I have four podcasts where I showed that how to get a job in the industry. One, the first episode was a research scientist and related job. And then I moved to second episode where you will find application scientists and related job. And then I showed third, a third episode where uh, like a different uh, dimension, which is sales, project management, and marketing or related jobs. And then I showed in uh, the fourth episode how you can get government job and related job in the industry. So beyond that, I want to tell you some top master plans. You have to plan 
uh, if you want to move to the global uh, area, especially in the global market. In the job market, um, especially in the industry, they're very ruthless. I, at the same time, they're very rewarding if you know how to, how to crack it down. So first, my first question to you, are you going to pursue your graduate degree and postdoc? It, it, it should be yes, if you are in the STEM field, especially biology. Biology needs PhD, um, at least masters, if you want to work in a Europe, America, or, or Australia, or Canada, whatever you think about. So, so therefore, you need to have a, uh, have a uh, master's or PhD and postdoc, especially you need to do postdoc in America, have a lot of publications, especially for Indian. It is too many Indians are waiting for the green card. And so therefore, the number is high. You have to show that what is the, uh, why, why you are different from others. So therefore, postdocs and, and, uh, and uh, other, other degrees are really helpful. And then my second question to you, do you fall in love with your publications and parents? Yeah, if you are in America or Europe, you want to make document, you need it. And also it will help you to get faculties. But if you forget about faculties, you want to move to the industry, and many research and development jobs that require, but it's not the end of the world. If you are already in America, have set out that, therefore publications and patents has nothing to do with the industry. They, even the a research and development, they don't care too much. There is a, a trade-off. So somewhere you need, somewhere you don't need, but it's better to have it. It will help you to enhance your career. So then I have to talk, are you going to join a paid career club? This is serious. When somebody is suffering, uh, let's say now everybody is suffering for Corona. Um, so COVID-19 disrupted everything, but there are bad people who want to earn money out of any kinds of uh, bad situations. Therefore, when PhD postdoc and graduate students are suffering, there are scientist associations. They want to make you a member and uh, want to get $500 or $300, $400. So my request to you, never join any career club. It's uh, everything is freely available. And even in a, with a very cheap cost, it's available for career enhancement. It's better to have a certification rather than joining to that group. And then uh, one thing is that I uh, do believe your supervisor's promise. Uh, so that academia, uh, professor can promise many things, but these days the funding are closed, uh, uh, especially globally, because um, uh, one thing, uh, academic funding is really limited in US right now, because they need to put a lot of money in COVID. And for previously, uh, there, there are money taking eye to the different, uh, different sectors. Uh, so sometimes uh, professors are kind, they are the kindest people. Uh, they want to help people, but uh, they cannot. So sometimes they promise and their promise is not uh, reliable. So therefore you need to think about whether that promise is uh, right or wrong, or it, it will really help you to get there. So therefore before believing uh, something, as I was promised by the University of Vermont to move to the faculty level, but finally, they want to give me that stuff. So that kind of thing, I have to understand. And then uh, one, the five, number fifth uh, is, um, are you networking with your global peers? Uh, by mean that, let's say you are sitting in India or Bangladesh or Pakistan, it doesn't matter. So you have to network with the person in America, Europe, or whomever. It's very easy. LinkedIn is a very good platform. Even there are many platforms uh, that where you can find, let's say you move to a conference, uh, you join there and uh, find many industrial professionals or, or academic professors, you, you want to talk to them and network. That will help you to get um, uh, positions in, um, in uh, anywhere. Let's say how I, uh, I didn't uh, apply for jobs for Shimarzu Corporation, but I had a collaboration in Japan. I helped them uh, to develop two things. Um, one is passive prolactospirionization, and another I help them endoscopic bed system. That both are really patentable work, but that work from my professor's lab went to that Shimarzu. Somehow uh, I got feedback and um, it's, a, it's a cosmic award. I, I helped there, but it came as a reward to me in America. That's why networking is very important. And then I want to say that, are you proud or arrogant after landing a job? So in industry, uh, it doesn't matter you have PhD or MBA or postdoc, whatever you have, or somebody doesn't have any degree, uh, even maybe he or she may be a janitor. Everybody, uh, 
are equal in the in the regards of respect. So everybody use everybody's first name and uh, they think about calling and fear. So there is no arrogant or proud. It, it doesn't matter. You know, whenever you put your foot in uh, industry or even in the American environment, even in academia, there is no such thing. So after landing, you have to be uh, show the compassion and empathy, no, no arrogance. That will help you to grow really in a good, a good position. So number seven, uh, do you learn to earn and protect your wealth? This is the 21st century. If you think about, oh no, I love science. It, it, this way, 21st century will not work. It's not the Einstein era. It's not even the Rabindranath Tagore era. Here, even though you are faculty, it doesn't matter. You earn 100K. Let's say you have $100,000. You put your money in the bank, and then bank will use your money to gain. So you need to learn how to earn more at the same time, invest to make your money uh, more. So that's, that's called quantum economics. So therefore, you have to earn um, and then you have to make uh, how to invest and then you need to learn how to protect your wealth. Otherwise, 21st century, you will really suffer. And then another thing, uh, do you victimize yourself? Uh, the reason I am asking, there was a bad event in, in Wisconsin area. One of the students from Bangladesh, um, he, in two years, he published 10 papers. So he's a very gifted scientist or gifted engineer. But he committed uh, to suicide. He killed himself. Uh, he had a pro problem with his uh, boss or something. Uh, so he wasn't ha happy. So then the one the, on Saturday night, he killed himself you know, at the same laboratory by hanging himself. So never victimize yourself. Let's say you don't publish one laboratory good publications, then another laboratory good publications. Third laboratory, you may be booming with publications and booming with the jobs. It happened to me. I, I couldn't survive in my, my first PhD. But after going to my second PhD, I published 10 publications. And then um, about uh, during my postdocs, uh, about total, as, as Dr. Shidesha said, over 35 publications and books, etc. So it, if you don't find a good positions and bad situations in one lab, move to the another lab, or on job in a company, move to the another job. So that's my, my, my suggestion. So there is another thing, I, are you a product or service for an academic system? The reason I am asking, academia is also industry. Either, <clears throat> either it is um, a profit or non-profit, it doesn't matter, somebody is investing. So in America, it's huge. So they make a system that uh, global talented students come to America or Europe and work for a little money and do the really hard work. It's, it's very important to have publications and great Mm, great career uh, and uh, everything and uh, all those things, but you have to also think about don't do a 10 year PhD. I know one student from South India in my lab in Vermont, she finished PhD in 11 years. And I know many postdocs doing uh, for 20 years. So you don't become a system or service for an academic system. So you have to think about every time that uh, how to escape and how to enhance yourself and grow uh, professionally so that you are you are not on the track and then another thing do you keep current with your latest industrial trends this is huge you see that um why the covid 19 vaccine uh, came so fast because they did a simulation in uh, using the artificial intelligence so you are chemist doesn't matter i was electrical engineer become chemist so therefore you can change your field anytime but uh, you don't have to do a lot of codings and even no codings, but you need to learn how industry is moving. Uh, let's say I used to do the, all of the analytical work and uh, in the Excel sheet. Now there are sophisticated software. So you need to learn how the industry is moving and which direction is moving. And therefore it's very important to uh, have the knowledge about the current industrial trends. Now I want to show you one funny thing. Our firing and getting fired uh, is, the, is a bad thing. It's not really a bad thing. Uh, getting fired or firing is very important for the industry. And let's say bottom 10 level, uh, bottom 10% um, is doing really bad. Uh, industry needs to fire because otherwise the, that 10% will collapse the 90%. So therefore industry fire people. And uh, I know many things, many people will think about, oh, firing is how can be a good thing. Firing is a good thing for the industry for save the economy. At the same time, it's good for the, People, they, I know there are many people, they are stagnant. They are not moving from the place. They are not moving from the positions. So they fire. When they got fired, 
they can reimagine and redesign themselves. I know many people who have started um, own company and very successful company. In Wisconsin, I saw a guy. And I know many people who sense um, uh, their career style and then they increase their salary five times, double, or sometimes 10%, 20% after five years. So getting fired is a really good thing. So the reason I got the firing things because the industry world is very ruthless. So therefore you need to know what to do after getting fired. Uh, I talked a lot of good things, but that's why I want to give a cautionary things that the industry can do. So if you get fired, you need to send mail or message to all the your network, not to tell them that I got fired. You tell that I, I'm open for job, could you please help me? And if you, you have to do a very diplomatic way and professional way that somebody, if you send thousand uh, messages or uh, contact with thousand person, I'm a uh, thousand people, I'm sure out of 10 will really directly help you. So this is a beautiful place where is a Maryland where I'm currently sitting for my uh, job and I'll be moving from uh, New Hampshire and Boston area to here. And here now, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your uh, attention and listening to my talk. I hope you and your family are safe during this, um, uh, this uh, really bad situations and bad pandemic. I, I, I wish you all the best. Thank you, Dr. Nudal Mandal. Uh, it was uh, indeed a wonderful uh, talk. And uh, now uh, the topic is open for discussion. So participants, you can uh, post your questions in Q&A. Yeah, I got a one question, I, I think. Yeah. Oh, uh, somebody is asking that oh, uh, how to build a strong network in uh, U.S. industry for a job seeker. It's a very easy. Um, yeah. There are many ways. If you are lucky enough to attend the conference, you go to the, all the booth and uh, where the industries are. And um, the way I do, uh, if I see the uh, booth, I take from their card. And uh, I, if I show my poster, um, I, I ask people to uh, card, especially if I see that I want to move to that person. And then I send a personal mail. Um, normally, and let me tell you one story. There was a, when I was, I got green card in only five weeks. Uh, my my uh, green card petition was written by one of the best professor from America. His name is Professor Cooks. He's the number one. He's like a god in master's field. And I wrote to him. I didn't know these things. I, 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 I would have known these things while I was in Japan. After coming to America, I wrote to him, uh, sir, can you please write a recommendation for me? I sent my publication that I am a competent scientist. He didn't reply. Then my wife was saying, why you don't write again? So I wrote three times, he replied. And then he gave a standing recommendation. And what happened? And that recommendation number one, because he's the only analytical scientist uh, uh, professor in the Academy of Science. That's helped me to get green card in five weeks. So that means um, if somebody is not contacting you or replying you again well, one time, you have to do again and again. And, um, and also you can use your LinkedIn to write. Uh, uh, every time when you send a friend request or any request, you wrote a short note and then try to add, ask paper, ask publications or, or ask, talk about the good thing about uh, themselves, not the personal things, but the professional things. And that, sir, I like your career path and I want to have a similar career path. How can I make it? And this kind of thing, people like uh, uh, to give advice and some people okay. may not like, if somebody is neglecting, it doesn't matter. There are thousands of other people, so you can make it. Hello, Uma Devi, I think uh, you raised your hand. Any question? Participant, any questions? Yes. If no questions, you can also uh, pose your questions late any time and we will actually connect to uh, Dr. Mudal Mandal so that he can answer your questions later also. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mudal Mandal, uh, for nice presentation and sharing your experience. And actually, we can learn a lot from you that 
you started your education in electrical engineering but now you are into business so so that shows like you know uh, drastic transition in your career so one can understand it is not what you study now means you may be biochemist or you may be microbiologist or biotechnologist doesn't matter even environment science but if you have a goal if you have aim in your life definitely you can achieve it the best example is dr mudul mandal as he mentioned i know that story and when i was in usa even he used to tell me so go for green uh, card and he actually gave me a lot of advices there and uh, i'm very thankful for him to accept and i got two questions here. here thank you so much uh, one um, yes please somebody uh, asked me why i am doing mba after all that um <laughs> yeah. like, is not required basically if you want to stay in a, a research path let's say you want to move to the research career and go from the research sub scientist senior scientist principal scientist as chief director director and then vice president to cso cto you don't need that but if you want since we are very stereotype scientists i i have a very high core technical background whenever i am looking for i was looking for a management position especially in business world uh, they are not understanding why what i can bring to the plate Uh, so when i give the, the mba i normally get 100% all the courses because uh, I, we are from analytical and um, chemist do a lot of analytical chemistry and they know how to do the analytics things so that's why mostly scientists and engineer get um, nearly 100% in mba but mba the society still think that mba people are uh, can do the better business it's, it's not true but uh, but that way you, you can get the job faster even your salary could be 40000 more and that's the purpose i am i have been doing the mba and learning the business of why what, what can separate myself from others because these are thousands of people are looking for one job if you have more education and if there are there are people who will think about um that um, you don't need uh, a lot of uh, degrees uh, but even if you follow the elon musk he will tell that you don't need mba you don't need phd uh, but uh, not everybody is elon musk but when you are looking for job it's a uh, 10 candidates they will industry will try to segregate yourself of uh, uh, you you to from others that's why it's uh, it's important and one question i got that can you please share the experience applied science into marketing uh, it's a, it's a very good thing you have to find out um, that uh, what uh, what potential you have Uh, like um, you are going to conference let's say and in the conference you are showing a presentation uh, poster or presentation while you attempt to know how to sell uh, how to sell your science to the community and the same way you have to make a resume you that way that you can translate which part of your scientific research or scientific development to the business and that way you can apply and uh, getting some of the certification Uh, in the sales and marketing or business uh, accounting finance will help you to get um, that interview and when you get the interview after getting the interview or it's all about talking the more you can talk um, the business and science um, uh, together and if you can uh, blend between the science and management and marketing uh, that will help you to land the position and then uh, somebody um, Nagar 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 asked me why uh, why I chose uh, biological science uh, from electrical engineering. In 2005, one of the ten years worldwide died in front of me uh, because of the dialysis equipment out of order. I was a little bit late, and that that give me give, that young boy he fell down from the tree, and he was very strong. Uh, it's a poor family, so they couldn't take a private hospitals to dialysis. This can his kidney temporarily shut down and then uh, i was i was late because of the bangladesh india you know the traffic are so jam uh, traffic jam and then at that time i was very upset about um, a 10 year guy a boy died and then i changed um, i wanted to do something in a in a, a medical equipment so that that that's why i applied to the biomedical engineering uh, but finally from biomedical engineering somehow 
I, uh, when I saw the mass spectrometer, it's a very fancy equipment. It can tell the molecular weight of uh, one, one atom. And then I took, wow, wow. So that's uh, finally it attracted to the bi biological science. I, I did my, my master's thesis from electrical engineering to proteomics and then moved to slowly that field. And in biological world, uh, people have a very much misunderstanding that electrical engineer earn more money than biological science. That is completely wrong thing. It's a, it's a equal salary in America. Even biology now is the shortest. Um, I, I encourage everybody's kids to study chemistry and biology together at the same time doing the electrical engineering, whatever. It's, it's for you. It's for your body that you can be healthier than other person if you know the biology and chemistry well. Chemistry is the mother of science and chemistry came from the physics, right? So um, that's why it's better, better. Everybody should do it, uh, even learn it, even don't go for the higher education. It's very important to have have the biological and chemical knowledge for the personal life. Somebody is asking that, um, is MSc enough to find a good job in a, yes, it's a, if you have experience, it's enough for getting job in Europe and Australia, Canada, but in America, it will be really hard without having a PhD because uh, Americans, uh, of America and India, they are not going together very well because too many Indians in America, uh, therefore you need to find um, a uh, more more credit credibility that will give you green card. Without green card, America is a pain. That's right. But is it difficult to get a job US without pursuing competitive exam like till no? I didn't have a 12 TOEFL because I study um, in Germany and Japan and um, I, even I am doing MBA without the, there is a requirement uh, for TOEFL and IELTS and GMAT. I didn't need it because I already have PhD. So if you have PhD, you don't need anything and better please come to an America. There is a shortage of the biological and chemical scientists right now. And um, uh, even uh, you will be surprised that uh, Moderna hire all the senior scientists over for $170,000 to the $220,000. So the salary is really, really high for chemistry and biology who know the, who have experience. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mudum Mandal for answering the questions. And if any questions, we will get back to you. Yeah, um, there is one question that four years, yes, there is no PhD for a year. I did PhD in two and a half year. Uh, there, because I, I, I finished it earlier. If I can finish earlier, why I should have to stay four years? So, I think there are many questions, but I don't know. I have time. On yeah, I think we, we run up, uh, you know, <laughs> time. So uh, yeah, you can uh, you can send me message to the my LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, um, anywhere. Yeah. If I get your message, I'll answer you one by one. I'm I'm very good to answering. So no worries. Please send me personal email, personal connections. It doesn't matter. I'll accept it and I'll answer all of your questions. Um, I may not answer immediately, but I'll do it. I'm very kind on it. That should be yeah, fine. Thank you so much. That's nice thank of you. you very much. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Nice of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very so, much, Dr. Uh, Mandal. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you for inviting. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, um, our next speaker, I would like to there. Yes, Siddesh. Hi, Hello. good morning. Yes. Hi, good morning. So, it is my privilege to introduce uh, Kanya. Uh, she was my friend since 2004, and I know her very well. Uh, she is active, you can see. She will be uh, smiling all the time. That's a great, uh, you know, jewelry, jewelry, so jewelry for anybody. So that makes, um, you know, uh, the atmosphere um, and nice. Okay, so let me introduce her first. So she is currently working as a global document management coordinator in Bioclinica, India, and uh, she is a certified ISO 9001 lead auditor. She served as R&D manager at the Supreme Pharmaceuticals for around 10 years, and she collaborated with various institutions like organizations that include SWRI, USA, Brace Cambridge, Germany, CFTRI, CDRI, Lucknow, University of Mysore, our own JSS Ayurvedic College and JSS Pharmacy College, Mysore, etc. So she, she was also, that means she has 
um, you know, uh, a good working culture and she can collaborate with many people. And she was former member of uh, Intellectual Property Steering Committee, managed by Committee of Intellectual Property Rights, Mysore. And she graduated from University of Mysore, uh, MSc in Biochemistry in 2016. And she won a Rockstar Award in 2018 and also awarded Best All-Rounder in 2019 for her great work. And uh, she is one of the top rated employees in the industry. So she actually, that, like the projects that she was involved in uh, Supreme Pharmaceuticals are actually led to the development of product, natural product, I think. And they have been commercialized, some of them like anti-diabetic and anti-obese agents. And uh, she also, because she's active and she wants to be involved, she has participated in several conferences and meetings in and out of India, like Spain and um, I think uh, Malaysia, other places. And uh, the good co-curricular activity, as I mentioned, for anybody, any person having extra talent our co-curricular is always good. So she is uh, more into cultural activities. She, she won prizes for essay writing during her I mean, education, quiz, speak and speak, debate. Uh, we used to debate, fancy dress and mono acting, acting hit, rangoli, et cetera. And uh, she's, a, she's also a good writer. So she composes poem and used to discuss a lot on poetry uh, since I was, uh, I, I was also. So uh, I'm happy to uh, welcome um, Kanya to deliver our lecture and thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, rendering your lecture. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Kanya. I'm audible, Siddesh. Yes, yes, you are. Okay. Yes, we can see your slides too. Okay, fine then. Okay. Uh, namaste. Uh, I would like to express my sincere outlet uh, gratitude to all the dignitaries from uh, JSS AHER for providing me an opportunity to share my thoughts in this webinar. A warm welcome to all my life science peers and participants. I'm super excited to interact with our progeny. So when I was approached by Dr. Siddesh uh, for sharing this topic for this webinar, I was a little perplexed. I was just thinking what to tell with these uh, participants. Suddenly, three CS come to my picture. So which goes synergetically with three PS, that is plan, prepare and prosper. Here you go, three CS, choose, compose and conquer. So as you have seen and listened many of uh, you know, lectures from my uh, life science peers, it might be repetitive. But I want to ask some of the basic questions to all the participants. So how do you want to come up with this background that is life science background? And after bachelor's or master's, what do you want to become? Uh, like uh, master's means it's not only in biochemistry or biotechnology or microbiology or various disciplines of life sciences and bachelor's in engineering that be in biotech or be in biomedical engineering, etc. Any idea or decision about uh, made about your career? Where next? What to choose after my bachelor's or master's or PhD and PDF? So I'll be sharing, uh, showing uh, various avenues which will lead uh, you to the destination you want to go. So uh, one of my favorite uh, quote says, if you love your job or if you do what you love, then you'll never work a single day in your life. So choose what you love. Sometimes you end up with a job which you don't love because you want to earn. 
then what to do? Then do love what you are doing. So you should develop that love and affectionate and passionate about your job you are doing. So identify what is your passion. Understand your skills. And I'm just uh, sharing few examples on various fields to choose as a life science scholar. To start with, I'm uh, sharing my experience and various opportunities in pharmaceutical industry. Why uh, in pharmaceutical industry? As Siddish said, my career started as an R&D personnel in pharmaceutical industry. To get a job as an R&D person in pharmaceutical industry was not an easy one. Because I remember, you know, the very first day of my master's when Professor Cletus de Souza asked our entire gathering about what to become after uh, MSc, like what do you want to pursue after MSc? Many of my friends said they want to do research, they want to go abroad and they want to higher studies and all. But for me, my path was clear. I want to work in industry and that too in R&D in particular. So my path was clear. And after, uh, you know, drilling of 90 minutes of interview with uh, our MD, uh, ex-MD like uh, Rav sir, I got into R&D department as junior scientist. Is that only R&D department you can serve in pharmaceutical industry? No, there are various other departments as well, like quality assurance, quality control, analytical development laboratory, production department, and various departments as well. So after uh, nine years of core, uh, pharmaceutical experience where I have involved in 100 plus projects from various pharmaceutical, herbal, nutraceutical projects, I had to quit. So from uh, junior scientist to R&D manager and from uh, working as an individual because I did not have any assistant. I was just sitting in one corner of a QC department and started my R&D job. But with my passion and my interest and my commitment, I used to, you know, ask my manager, uh, that is MD of Supreme Pharmaceuticals, to equip myself to develop more and more projects. He is generous and compassionate with uh, to, towards R&D. And after starting my career as a single individual personnel, I, you know, uh, started leading a team of eight individuals from various life science uh, disciplines and I developed a sophisticated R&D laboratories in supreme pharmaceutical industry catering to various clientele from India and abroad as well. And, uh, you know, for your information, we at Supreme Pharmaceutical Industry are the largest consum consumers of vitamin D. And see, so we are into, uh, uh, you know, we were into uh, vitamins, stabilized vitamins and minerals as well. So I had to quit uh, as an R&D manager, which was my passionate job due to various reasons. I had to come out from my comfort zone to develop and see where is the other option as well. So my eyes were open and I was just choosing whether I have to choose as a teaching option because I have to be within 100 kilometers of radius because of my personal commitments. So what next? The next thing is pharmacovigilance or drug safety companies, which I'm currently working in. So how many of you are aware of drug safety companies? If you are in US or Europe or any other countries, uh, 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 you know, uh, apart from India, you'll be very much aware of this drug safety or pharmacovigilance. So what does drug safety companies do? So they are into analyzing the adverse drug events. So uh, do we have companies in India? Yes, in Mysore itself. I'm working in Bioclinica in Mysore. So even in Bangalore, you have n number of companies which are involved in drug safety. And also uh, in and around of India, there are many companies which are offering pharmacovigilance services. So there are various departments which you can uh, 
take opportunities like operations, which, uh, you know, they'll take healthcare professionals, pharmaco pharmacy students, MBBS, MD students, BSc nursing students. And also there are many companies in Bangalore like uh, IQVA and other companies which they prefer any life science graduates or postgraduates. Quality assurance, MICC. MICC means it's uh, medical information call center and they prefer any life science graduates even in our companies and learning management system, business excellence and operational excellence department as well to name a few. So the only limitations with MICC that medical information call center is that you have to work only night shift. Whether as a girl, we can work in my night shift. Yes, of course. Even in my previous organization, I used to work in shift because in R and D, uh, you know, you cannot even work uh, with time sticking to your clock like nine to five job never work because you will get your uh, equipments for scaling up batches only after the production batch is done. So you need to wait. And once I started getting the equipments, it was already four p.m. Uh, hitting the clock. Should I leave and go to home? No. I have to start and I have to complete in order to achieve what I want. Same here in pharmacovigilance company, uh, in my, um, you know, in medical information call center, there are people who are working in night shift. You may be surprised that I have a colleague who is leading a couple of projects in MICC he is a PhD scholar in biochemistry. She has from Northeast uh, region of India. She has completed her master's in biochemistry and did a PhD, but designed her career in MICC department. There are uh, in a couple of managers who are ladies and doing her best in leading eight to 10 projects of MICC. It doesn't mean that their gender is important. And uh, business excellence and operational excellence, learning managers, management system, which I'm currently into, and there are various options to name a few. And uh, apart from this, there are various other fields to choose also, like food and nutraceuticals, herbal flavor and fragrance industries. If you just uh, Google it out, within 200 kilometers of radius, you could get hundreds of industries which are into this. And companies which offer bioavailability, efficacy and toxicology studies. As my previous speaker clearly explained the importance of toxicology studies, CROs, and have you uh, heard about medical imaging and clinical adjudication? Google it out. You may have n number of options over there. Pathology labs and hospitals, forensic laboratories, because my seniors have designed their careers in forensic laboratories and in crime department as well. Research laboratories, of course, this is a basis of developing any drugs or any molecules which help humanity. Teaching, definitely, they are the one who shows us a path. Proofreading or editing of scientific journals, where in, you know, in uh, India alone, we have uh, 10,000 plus jobs only for proofreading and editing of scientific journals. And CTSM and RTC, RTSM departments, like clinical trial supply management and randomized and trial supply management studies. There are many startups in Bangalore which are require which require you know licensed aspirants as well for building their career and building their uh, organization as well. And you can become an entrepreneur, etc., etc., etc. The list will not limit or end you. So with the current pandemic. Uh, you know, as you are aware, uh, the importance of uh, vaccine with this uh, current pandemic COVID-19. So what is the role of life science students with this? Excuse me. So uh, in drug development, say uh, vaccine for COVID-19, what are the various levels which we as a life science students are involved? It's drug discovery from a scratch to develop a prototype and then to study our efficacy studies and toxicology studies, preclinical studies, phase one, phase two, phase three studies, and then branding and patenting and trademarking, it can go up there as well and then to later stages as well. 
and then drug manufacturing from scaling up batches to uh, individual from you know uh, smaller batches to scaling up of manufacturing and then drug release in the market where in the regulatory office and approvals coming picture and drug safety that is phase four studies that is post marketing studies wherein we are involved so excuse me so as I was uh, explaining so drug safety so that is called post marketing studies why it is important that is phase four studies so in this drug discovery uh, the trials were limited to a specific group of people say for example uh, we have considered only 18 to 60 uh, years of people we are uh, excluded uh, you know pediatric or geriatric personnel for this study and when the drug is released to a wide variety or wide into the market there you know uh, with the different uh, genetics different races different geographical locations there might be a lot of adverse drug events so we need to report and submit to us fda ema european medical agencies or health canada in order to have uh, in uh, that product in the market what if the surge is high and you'll receive a lot of uh, adverse drug events and reactions then immediately that product is taken back from the market but in india that awareness is limited so here you go uh, uh, participants you can be a part of very important uh, uh, phases of drug development so now you have chosen your path right so where i have to be now what is the key to enter into the world of job opportunities it is nothing but a well written cv so what are the salient features you have to keep in mind while drafting a cv so if you google it out you will get n number of examples and uh, you know tips to write a good cv so i'm just uh, sharing few with you people uh, so it should be error free the spell check is very important why i'm stressing this because as i'm a hiring manager in bioclinica and uh, other companies as well and i was in uh, interview panel i have seen people uh, you know the candidates were rejected just because there were two spell check uh, spell error in their resume this shows how much serious they are into so our director immediately rejected their uh, uh, candidates you know so please pay attention to the spelling error in your cv and then it should be clear and legible fonts no fancy things consistent with the layout brief and relevant list relevant experience or uh, work achievements even as a student as well if you are well versed in some instruments say uh, spectrophotometers or uh, liquid chromatography techniques or chrom uh, chromatography techniques or gel filtration if you are well versed and you have hands on experience this stress upon there and what are the achievements as a student you have uh, done so far please mention in your cv correct education details put relevant skills that fit into the required job hobbies and interest a basic personal information so here i have seen people uh, you know putting their religion and caste and even we feel like as a company which i am working we don't feel to enter their gender as well we want to uh, take a job uh, we want to offer a job as an individual so basic personal information is fine enough without this additional uh additives and complement with uh, your cv with a good covering letter as my previous speaker said you can uh, reach out to a people who are into this uh, uh field to guide you on how to write a cv and how to come up with a good covering letter because as i said previously it is a key for to enter into this world of job so i'm just sharing with you all a bad cv see here you can see it is not in a structured way they started their achievements and then started with the education and there also it is not consistent and then uh, employment details without much detailing about what they were into in each uh, job role and then skills that's it 
but if you go with a good one see personal profile statement followed by achievements and then education and employment here you can just you know play a little while you can put your employment first and then education and then what are the additional qualification you have acquired while uh, you know into that job and the additional skill sets you have hobbies and interests and references you have any So now your CV is ready and you get a call for the interview. So what is a magic pill you want to be, you want to have to face an interview? Self-confidence. Yes, self-confidence is a superpower. Once you start believing in yourself, magic just start happening. So believe in yourself. And then what are the preparations you need to make before facing an interview? your fundamental should be strong this is what the other co-speakers are also stressing upon so learn what you are doing perfectly what is the principle behind any experiment what is the principle behind this instrument why it is working like that what is the difference between that equipment and this equipment why can't i use that equipment instead of this just analyze 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 and you know just Make your fundamentals strong enough. Emphasize on your skills, crisp and clear communication. Practice. So if you Google, you'll get a common interview questions. Prepare for that. Know about your interview company. If you get a call from Bioclinica, just understand what is Bioclinica up to. And wear a clean outfit with a smile in your face and face the interview. So you'll get like, you know, common questions like describe yourself and describe about your previous job or uh, as a student, what are your achievements and all just prepare that and definitely you will be hired. So what that after hiring or getting into job. So now the third C coming to picture. So whether I want to settle down with the same job after two to three years. You want to grow, right? So how to conquer in whatever choose I in whatever field I have chosen. So to conquer in your job, in your career, you have to understand your job well. Improve your knowledge. The knowledge shouldn't stop there. Study and update yourself. Flexible with the timings and flexible with the shifts and flexible with your learnings. Even if you don't uh, like also, sometimes you have to do some jobs in industry, like some of the projects. So you should uh, uh, take into the consideration of that factors as well. Committed. Commit your, uh, you should be committed to your job. Good team player. Stability. Because I have seen people who frequently change their jobs every one year or six months. No, you will not learn anything within a year. So until you get, uh, uh, you know, experience and uh, uh, understand your job in the market, be stable. At least two to three years, don't change a job. And then definitely you'll march up in your career ladder. So the takeaway messages, uh, uh, like the key points uh, from this uh, presentation, I want to summarize. So choose what you want and love what you do. Acquire skill sets. Update your CV and resume. Every three to four months, there should be neat thing in your resume. Say, for example, it should be a small points as well. I'll see my resume after four months. Say, yes, well, I haven't uh, updated my resume. So I should learn something, whether it's a small thing as well, like uh, update my skills in Excel sheets, update my skills in PPTs, or update my skills in MS Word, or learn new equipments, or learn new process. Build your network. That's very important. Register yourself in various and trustworthy job portals, and do not stop learning. Knowledge flow should be continuous. And understand the current job market. What are the job options you have? So I end up my, uh, you know, the session after sharing my experiences because I have given more time in my uh, sharing my experience as an R&D personnel. 
So my experience as an R&D person, as I previously mentioned, I was very much new when I entered this R&D lab or this pharmaceutical industry with zero knowledge. So how I equipped myself, I have, how I conquered myself in this job, because the very first thing I did was brought a book of theory and practices of industrial uh, pharmacy from black men. This is a Bible of pharmacy students because they will be knowing all these things. But I'm a biochemist and serving in pharmaceutical uh, industry. Then how to do that? I set up a library in R&D and uh, I had all my books and then studied that and made myself equipped with the terminologies and concepts of pharmacy, like whether it's excipients or additives or active pharmaceutical ingredients, be it that I have to understand, I have to understand the techniques of coating pans, spray dryer, extruder, whatnot, but I have to equip myself, understand the skill sets. So, and I have to just give my experience as uh, projects, how I handled projects with one or two projects which I have handled, because I clearly remember the day when I joined my first job, that is June 21st. And then just after a day, I was given up a project to convert a thick, viscous vitamin E liquid into a free flowing powder. I was really much uh, uh, afraid how to do that. I got a training from my senior and I was just learning, okay, you have to add excipients and then you have to coating properly and then you need to make a free flowing uh, powder. Once you got the desired product, which met the client expectation, I was like, yeah, I got that. That was a very simple project. Later, after a month, I got a herbal project, which is Garcinia Combogia. It's an uh, anti-obese project, which I was tied up with uh, Glycon Technologies from USA, Southwest Research Institute, USA, to develop that project. I uh, was involved because I was given a paper wherein they developed successfully a 10 gram of powder. Now my challenge was to scale up that batch from 10 gram to 5 tons to 10 tons. How to do that and the cost effective. So when we do 10 grams or 20 grams and, uh, you know, uh, scale up batches in one cages, the same techniques won't work. You have to understand what is it going wrong. So then it comes, you know, if you uh, see my uh, previous uh, R&D laboratory, I have hung up on a periodic table. I want to understand how the alkaline earth materials work with HCA, hydroxycitric acid. Till now, even after I left the job from my previous organization, and this is uh, way before 2006 or seven, I still remember the molecular weight. It is just twined in my DNA. The molecular weight, how it behaves with alkaline earth materials and how it reacts with the other uh, divalent uh, earth materials valency, first order reactions, how it behaves when you just uh, increase the temperature or decrease the temperature, everything is still, uh, you know, saved in my memory because that was a passion. And then uh, when I developed one kilo of product and I would say, yes, I met all the, uh, uh, you know, specifications as described by the clients and the product is ready. Then when, when I went to uh, finance department, all my happiness just drained off because the costing was too much high. So that was a failure. Then what to do? You have to develop any product which is cost effective in the industry. That was a mantra. So I learned the costing techniques from finance department. So once I develop a, uh, you know, any product in R&D, I used to do a costing calculation, whether it really serves the need. Uh, in industry. Then only I used to go with uh, finance department and said, definitely I used to get because I have learned that caustic technolo costing technology as well. So this is how I flourished in R&D department with my master's degree. So as I said before, uh, my career, you know, I have to choose a different uh, field altogether, you know, uh, from pharmaceutical industry to a pharmacovigilance or drug safety company. And I was appointed as project quality and compliance lead, supporting business and operational excellence department and also working closely with quality assurance. So there, what is the additional skill, skill set which I have acquired? Yes, I was very much new into this PV world. I haven't studied uh, any of the terminologies used in PV or business excellence. What did I do? 
I studied, I googled it out. What are six sigma techniques? What are PDCA? What is RCA? And come up with this because my manager told only one thing: go there and understand why that project is not meeting the client's expectations against the quality. What is it happening? Then come up with the mitigation plan. So I was very much, uh, you know, scared. Also, how to do that? I don't know any knowledge about that. I learned. I sat with the subject matter experts, and I learned. And then I monitored their project and come up with a detailed RCA. So for each case, I used to sit with four to five hours with a single personal and understand where it is going wrong. And I made a detailed uh, case study, you know, detailed case. And I have pointed out what are the root causes and what is a major root cause which is affecting their quality. And then I do not know the mitigation plan. Then I have uh, seek. the experienced personnel in that project and the different other cross functional department and come up with a mitigation plan and yes we had a green project that is more than 96% what the client is uh, expected this is one of my uh, you know success as a pqc lead and that too we were serving in a us companies like pfizer and uh, baxter and other clientels as well later uh, when i was serving uh, successfully in as a pqc lead my top management our bioclinica top management chose me to lead a electronic document management system coordinator so what to do because at that time i has to work closely with quality assurance and quality control people so i should have myself equipped with other skill sets as well in that case i enrolled myself for a leading uh, auditor course and i am a certified iso lead auditor to know the facts and to know the uh, you know clauses and to know how a good documentation be like and what are the other clauses you should know that so then uh as a global document management coordinator i pulled up uh, the project successfully and i implemented a electronic document management system in bioclinica successfully two and a half years before and i got promoted there as well so my career started with a junior r&d scientist and now ended up with global document management coordinator and i am a masters in biochemistry did my study ended up with only masters in biochemistry no but is that only uh, phd or pdf scholars will have a career no the promising you will have a promising career in various fields provided you are passionate enough provided you are uh, you know you your eyes are wide open to the current job market and provided you learn all the business jargons and have a connection with the uh, professionals in the linkedin environment and be in touch with uh, professors because in order to develop a successful projects i have traveled length and breadth of, uh, across the india from cftri library i was an active member of cftri library to cdri lucknow and then from almora gods because i was involved in herbal products where it is there so i was traveling uh, from nainital and then how to do uh, you know scaling up patches what are the equipments involved i went to wapi gujarat nobody is stopping from me so you have to do and you have to see where the path is okay so with this i want to thank dr siddesh who pulled me in here and i also thank him because i was uh, literally forgotten uh, like i was uh, uh penning down few poems also with him we have participated right siddesh in dasara kavi yes. goshti also yes. district level poem poem competition so all this uh, talents are the law in uh, you know hobbies will keep you alive you know so and i also thank my family members because i used to go uh, 8 or 9 o'clock uh, to job and i used to come only for the dinner so in order to do that sometimes you need to sacrifice a little bit but that doesn't stop you uh, you know from growing and that doesn't uh, you know make you physically strain unless until your mind is fresh and unless you are happy what you are doing so each one are unique each one is special that is you you have to make your career choice wise enough and then choose from what you want and compose yourself to where you want to and then conquer where you are into a different level altogether with this i end up my presentation and sorry if there are any disturbances because i was just giving uh, my seminar in my house and i'm open to any questions and answers thank you sidesh 
So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Kanya, for uh, a nice talk, actually. And it, indeed, it covered most of the things. You covered, like, the opportunities, how to go about, how to plan, and, like, you know, uh, as you mentioned, um, conquering, conquering depends, again, planning. So your talk was uh, composed. So compose. What was it? Compose. Choose, compose, and conquer. So choose. So it was nice talk, and I think uh, all the participants got um, the broad, you know, uh, visionary about the opportunities. It is not just about the academia, but there are many plenty and different sectors. So. Uh, due to shortage of time, uh, and uh, we, since we are running out of time, so we will take only two or three questions now. And the other questions, I know, like uh, Kanya uh, was actually active uh, last day also. She was answering for others' questions also. So she is very much happy and she's kind enough. She answers every, all the questions in the Q&A questions, but uh, we will take only two or three questions now, okay? Uh, thank you um, again, Kanya. And now, thank you, the question, yeah. So the question is, um, okay. Can you join for a job in uh, drug safety after MSc without any experience? Of course, yes. I have interviewed people, you know, masters in biochemistry, microbiology, or any other life science. So if your language is good enough, you can start your career in MICC department. If you are well versed, uh, uh, you know, in your life science subjects, you can come into uh, drug safety operations as well. As I mentioned, there are a few companies in Bangalore which are taking my friend who is just completed our master's in biochemistry. I successfully joined IQVA, one of the leading bio, uh, drug safety companies. So definitely, yes, there are many opportunities in drug safety components, not only in operations, but other departments as well. So does the microbiology student have any role in drug industry? Pharmaceutical industries? Yes, we do have. Yesterday also, I received a call from my uh, one of the companies which was associated that do you have any microbiologist which we need it very often? So definitely any of the pharmaceutical industry, they need microbiologists. For drug safety, it's a dry lab. Definitely you will be trained to do a drug safety business as well. Okay. So with that, uh, I think uh, the other questions, I would request the Kanya to answer. Uh, Definitely, Siddesh, I'll session, do that. Please. Of course. Yes. So due to the shortage of uh, time, uh, thank you so much uh, for accepting our invitation and to deliver the wonderful lecture. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you, all uh, the dignitaries. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. So we will uh, welcome the next a speaker, so Sunetra Darabel. Sunetra Darabel, hello. Yes, Dr. Siddesh, I'm here. Okay, okay, great. So uh, let me introduce uh, Sunetra Darabel to you. Uh, she's currently working as the lead patent attorney consultant for the uh, Zacco India R&D Center, as well consultant for SNH Partners Bengaluru. Before joining, uh, the Jaco India at R&D Centers, she worked as Senior Patent Associate with the Clary Polex Bangalore and also Patent Associate in Candace Partners Bangalore. And she, is, she also worked as Healthcare Quality Consultant for National Accreditation Board, of, Board for Hospitals in 2012. And she is registered as Indian patent agent, and she qualified the patent agent exam in 2019. So she earned LLB degree uh, from Karnataka State Law University in 2016, but she did her MSc and obtained a degree from University of Mysore in 2011. And one important uh, thing about uh, Sunetra Darabel, she was a gold medalist uh, in biochemistry, she received BC Super Gold Medal for securing highest marks in biochemistry. And I put 
the percentage in within parenthesis the reason look at it we student like you know we have seen students even if they get marks around uh, 90 95 they feel bad but look at that doesn't count how much percentage it is it counts it as the knowledge so it was kind of uh, a strict evaluation earlier and uh, she scored secured highest mark in biochemistry and look at she she was the gold medalist in biochemistry but now she is entirely you know out of her um, you know the major uh, subject she is lead patient attorney and this is a great example for you people that you can take up different any kind of you know um, a job in future so this is again one important uh, uh, area which is coming up and which is required because patenting is important for uh, industry and also for academia so i would uh, request and welcome Uh, Sunetra Darabal uh, to deliver lecture. Thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, agreeing to uh, give us invited lecture. Thank you, and I welcome Sunetra. Thank you, sir. I would like to share my screen now. Yes, please. Is it visible? not at yes yes okay. now uh thank you sir for the lovely introduction so um i am sunetra derebai and i'm a patent attorney and i would like to share with you uh, some of the twists and turns that i encountered uh, in my career path as an intellectual property associate so um even after the good introduction i would like to reiterate uh, some of the points uh, in my career path for your better understanding and for some uh, insights so i passed out of university of uh, mysore in 2011 with an msc in biochemistry and i was at crossroads uh, i was not too keen on taking a phd because i did not want to work in a lab i wanted a kind of a desk job that involved a lot of writing uh, some of uh, creative skills and that involved interacting with people communication and all that so uh, i don't know is there an opportunity like that for me and at the same time i wanted to work in the science field in the biosciences field and that is when i stumbled across the uh, uh, field of intellectual property so uh, the field of intellectual property is very very broad it only does not involve patents it has trademarks copyrights industrial designs as well So after my MSc, I joined a law firm called KNS Partners in Bangalore as a patent associate, and I was associated in drafting patent applications for inventions pertaining to biochemistry, biotechnology, etc. I found the field very interesting because it had a lot to do with science. Eighty percent of it is to do with science. and 20% of it involves law or legal aspects uh now i would like to tell the students do not be demotivated by the fact that this field involves law as well because you will slowly start realizing and appreciating uh on how well the law has been framed by our framers where each and everything with respect to uh patenting inventions has been well thought out So after uh, say three years at KNS Partners, I joined an IP firm called Clevonex, and there I got a bit of exposure to how actually patents work in other jurisdictions like the United States and Europe. Now, patent is a territorial right. If you have a patent in India, you have a patent only in India. It doesn't mean that you have it in all the other countries as well. There are unique set of laws and statutes. 
governing patents in each and every country. And as a patent attorney, it is important for you at least to know the laws of India, Europe and USA. That is where the market mainly lies. So after uh, my experience in Clevolex, I joined uh, SNH Partners and I'm a consultant at Zacco India as well. And here also I'm getting to know a lot about European patent laws as well as Indian patent laws. Now in this introduction of mine, there is one thing that is missing uh, that is relevant industrial experience. Now industrial experience is not a mandatory feature uh, to become a patent uh, attorney, but it is nevertheless very ideal. After my MSc, if I had done even a couple of years of uh, R&D uh, or worked as a research assistant in one of the R&D centers, that would have definitely helped me a lot more because I would have had firsthand experience of how actually things work in industry. But nevertheless, it is not a mandatory feature if you are looking a career into patents. Now, these are the IPR, which is relevant for industry. One is patent, as you can see here. Uh, then is trademark, which is logo, which is associated with goods and services. And then is industrial design. Industrial design uh, defines the form and feature for a product for mass production. So these are the relevant IPRs when it comes to industry. Now, what are patents? Patent is a techno-legal document. As I said, it involves 80% of technical experience and about 20% of legal experience. To give you a good example of uh, how law actually works and for you to appreciate law, uh, in the COVID uh, situation, everybody is talking about uh, having a patent waiver. Now, Indian uh, Patents Act already has a provision for patent waiver in case of emergency drugs. It says that if a drug or a pharmaceutical product is not available to the public at reasonable prices, if it is not worked within the territory of India, and if the reasonable requirement of the public with regard to that patented invention is not met, then any per person or third party can seek a compulsory license for that product or the government itself can get a license for the product and start mass manufacture. There will be a patent waiver on this. So this is a scenario which nobody expected earlier. So earlier when I was reading the Patents Act as a very junior associate, I would wonder when would even such a scenario come or when would this law even be of certain use? Now I realize why they have put in that. So everything is in place. You slowly start understanding with regard to inventions that already laws are in place. And uh, there is no way that any industrial person can cheat the other of his uh, intellectual property or rights. So patent rights, as I uh, said earlier, are territorial. And it is granted for a certain period of time. That is, uh, to be precise, uh, 20 years from the date of filing. Now, patents are very important because they encourage industrial development. And they are very important for startups and institutes. Uh, they prevent duplication. They focus on commercial relevance. They prevent exploitation of researchers. They are a source of revenue and they are a source of technical information. So patents are a very, very important form of intellectual property for corporates, for startups, and for any kind of companies. Now, what is to be done when one has an inventive idea? Uh, when, and I, when I say inventive idea, it means an idea which is very unique, which a person who is skilled in the art. Now, this is a terminology that we use a lot in patents. A person skilled in the art is a person who is a scientist, uh, who has a good knowledge of a certain technical field, that when he reads few publications, few scientific journals, he is easily able to collaborate the ideas and come up with an inventive idea. So when one person has an inventive idea regarding a product which he foresees will have some commercial importance, what does he do? So usually we see that researchers and academicians go ahead and publish a paper and then come to us asking whether we can apply for a patent. However, we usually uh, advise our clients 
to protect your invention first by applying for a patent with whatever information you have regarding the product. The disclosure need not be complete. It could even be, uh, say, about 50% of work has been done and the next 50% needs to be done. Even then, with that idea, one can apply for a patent. And uh, later on, you can complete the patent after a year of applying for uh, an initial patent application when you have the complete information. So it is very necessary to first file a patent and then go for publication rather than vice versa if an inventor has an interest to commercialize the product. Because uh, it, once you have a publication first, then the publication itself will act as a prior art and it will uh, impede your process of obtaining a patent. Uh, but there is a, um, we have something called as a grace period in patent law saying that a, an inventor did not know. So he went ahead and published his uh, paper and uh, then he wanted to apply for a patent. So he's, uh, he's given a chance of applying for a patent uh, provided one year has not lapsed from the date of publishing the paper. If one year has lapsed, then I'm sorry, uh, the inventor cannot go ahead and apply for a patent. So the grace period lasts for only one year from the date of publication of a paper. So that is why we advise our clients to first protect your invention by applying for a patent and then go ahead and publish a paper. Now, what is the criteria for patentability? Uh, patentable inventions must meet three basic criteria. One is novelty, one is inventive step, and another is industrial applicability. By novelty, I say that uh, the patented idea must be completely new. For example, a new chemical entity, a new chemical composition, a new process of preparing a certain product, etc. Now, inventive step is the tricky part. It should not be obvious to a person skilled in the art. Meaning, if there are two, three documents in the same field and a skilled person is easily able to combine these documents and come up with the patented uh, invention, then inventive step is hampered. So it has to be an original feature of an invention that will bring technical advancement over the prior art and which has economic significance. And the third, uh, usually all patents have industrial applicability. So it is uh, more or less a guaranteed criteria. Novelty and, and inventive step are the most important issues to be taken care of. Uh, now, just to give you a brief scenario of pharma patenting in India, uh, what are not patentable in India? So as a patent associate, or even uh, not as a patent associate, even as a fresher who's trying to enter the IP field, you must clearly know the three criteria for patentability and what is patentable in India uh, and what is not patentable in India. Now, generic companies in India have a tough time in securing patents for their generic drugs because usually generic drugs are, say, salt forms, uh, isomers, or uh, esters, or ethers, or known chemical compounds. So they, are, uh, they might be new, but they are not completely inventive. They are just a salt form of an existing compound. So according to section 3D, new form of a known substance, new property of a known substance, or new use or application of a known substance are not patentable. And examples are salts, esters, ethers, polymorphs, etc., are not patentable. So as patent associates, it is our duty to highlight the importance of these kind of generic products, saying that efficacy comes into picture. Efficacy means efficiency. So you have to clearly uh, highlight and bring about the aspects of the current product with regard to how efficient it is when compared to the existing product. And that will fetch you a patent. Continuing on what are not patentable in India, Section 3E states that a substance obtained by a mere admixture is not patentable. So to explain this better, say you have three compounds, uh, A, B, C. These are known chemical compounds. And each of these compounds are said to have uh, about 20% efficiency in uh, treatment of a particular disease. Now, when you combine these three compounds, uh, it is obvious that the efficiency will be increased. So say the efficiency uh, will be increased by 30% is what most people would think. But if you prove that 
it is 90% efficacious, it is an unexpected result, then that mixture will not be a mere admixture. In that case, it would be patentable. But if it is only showing some 30% efficacy, then I'm not sure that it would be patentable. It would be branded as a mere admixture. Similarly, we have another section, section 3i. In India, a method of treatment is not patentable. So say a method of treating cancer by using a certain compound. So this kind of a patent claim would not be allowed in India. So as a patent associate starting out, uh, out as a fresher in the industry, you must at least have some knowledge of patentable inventions, at least within India. Now, this is a favorite uh, slide of mine uh, to show the difference between uh, India and other jurisdictions. So in India, as I said, a method of treatment or use claims are not patentable. But in Europe, uh, these kind of claims are patentable. Use of a product for treatment of asthma, and then we have another example, product X for use as a medicament, product X for use in the treatment of cancer, and product X for use in the treatment of leukemia. So these kind of claims are patentable in the EP scenario or the European scenario. But when it comes to India, only the product X will be patentable and none of the other claims pertaining to use or method of treatment are patentable. So what is the job of a patent associate or an attorney? Uh, when an inventor has an idea, he or she would come with you with, uh, with the idea and an invention disclosure format, you would have a face-to-face -face conversation or nowadays because of the COVID scenario, we usually have it online where the product or process is explained to us in detail. Or uh, And they will ask us, now we have this, is it patentable? As patent associates, it is our duty to do a thorough check on uh, whether each of the criteria are fulfilled. Is the product novel? Is the product inventive? And is the product having industrial applicability? And if an inventor says, I would like to have some idea on patents and publications which are existing in this technical field, we as patent associates should carry out a patentability search. We do a patentability search in paid databases as well as free databases. There are some highly specialized databases for carrying out uh, patentability search and we will filter out inventions. So you, you, you see this picture here where all the search results that a patent associate gets while trying to search for patents in a particular field gets filtered. And slowly he would filter it out through all the criteria and he would uh, reach the point where there are a few, I mean, one or two patents which appear to be very, very relevant to what the inventor is talking about. And we would tell the inventor, see, there is something that exists in this field. And uh, what is different in your product is this. You could work on this to make your product more inventive. And we would give suggestions to the inventor. And once the inventor has a very strong concept or idea that is patentable, he would come to us for drafting. So as a patent attorney, there is a very special and a unique way uh, that we learn of how to draft a patent. So the patent uh, document will have technical field, background, detailed description, examples, and claim drafting. Claim drafting is a very important field. As a patent attorney, you will take years to master the art of claim drafting. It's a very interesting field also. Uh, as a junior, you will just uh, look up to your seniors and supervisors for the claim drafting part, but slowly you will get the knack and uh, the way of uh, handling claim drafting. And as uh, we'll have to draft a patent application now for the invention, wherein we have to highlight all the advantages that is offered by the invention over existing art. Uh, to, to give you an example, the other day I had an inventor who had uh, an invention uh, for an LFA kit, a lateral flow assay kit uh, to test food allergens. He said uh, this kit is like a pregnancy test kit. Uh, if you just put a sample on the sample pad of the kit and if a line develops, it means that you're allergic to wheat. So he, he had given us very brief information. Uh, so I had to keep prodding him for more and more information. As in, what is the capture antibi antibody that is used in the control line of the kit? What is the capture antibody used in the test line of the kit? 
what is the material that the sample pad is made up of? The conjugate pad of the kit is made up of. And then all these LFE kits, they have a membrane. Uh, he, so the inventor told us that the membrane that he used was nitrocellulose. So I asked him, is there any other membrane that is permissible? Will PVDF also show similar results? So uh, what is the kind of buffer that is used? So he told us only sodium citrate is used. I asked him if sodium borate can be used, any other buffer of similar pH and molarity can be used? Because as a patent attorney, it is our duty to give uh, an entire broad scope of the invention uh, for protection. So otherwise, if he just restricts his uh, buffer to sodium citrate buffer, any other inventor can patent the same invention using a sodium borate buffer. So all the possible buffers, all the possible reagents that can be used in the kit should be enlisted while drafting the patent to get complete protection of, uh, over the invention. So that is another major responsibility of a patent associate to try and get as much as information possible from the inventor so that it is all put in the draft that will uh, uh, enable its easy processing and enable it to get a faster grant. And then uh, we come to patent prosecution. After the process of patent search and patent filing, next comes patent prosecution. So uh, you must know that when a patent application is filed in any uh, patent office, uh, for example, say India, it does not get granted right away. There are who are known as uh, patent examiners who sit in the patent office. They will scrutinize the invention or the application that we have submitted, and they will carry out an independent search on their own. They will come up with documents that target the novelty and inventive step feature of the patent application, and they will issue what is known as an examination report with a lot of objections. The objections could be technical in nature, the objections could be formal in nature. So as a patent attorney, it is our duty to scrutinize the uh, examination report, to read all the documents that the examiner has cited, to draw out the differences between the cited documents and the invention of interest, uh, to again discuss this invention with the inventor and get more facts as to the efficiency of the invention, and draft a very strong response saying that no, our invention is patentable because it is novel and inventive because of these, these, these features, uh, A, B, C, D, that highlights its efficiency over known products. The response document has to be very strong enough and convincing. And if the examiner is convinced, he will grant a patent right away. If an examiner has uh, certain more doubts, then he would uh, hold what is known as a hearing. So earlier, we used to go to the patent offices to attend the hearing. There are four patent offices in India, one in each metro city. Uh, but now, because of the COVID constraints, we have a video conferencing link that will be provided to us. And we have an online discussion with the examiner, wherein uh, we try to tell the examiner on the patentable aspects. And mostly, the examiner gets convinced, and he would uh, right away grant a patent. If not, he would reject the patent. And our job doesn't stop with the grant. Post-grant also, there'll be other uh, certain companies who would be following this particular uh, company who has got a patent, and they would come up with post-grant opposition. They would oppose the patent, and that would lead to, go, to, go into litigation. So post-grant also, there are certain works that a patent attorney must take care of in case there is a post-grant opposition, et cetera. And then we must file something called as a working statement for that product every year, showing how the product has been worked. What is the revenue that is being earned by the company? Because uh, if the product has not been worked and if it is of uh, critical value, then the government will start issuing licenses or it will invite a third party to get a license for that uh, particular product. So after grant also, our uh, work does not end. And also to keep the patent in force, renewals and annuities must be paid, which is an amount that must be paid every year till the completion of the 20th year to keep a patent in force. So that is the grant and post-grant formalities. So what is the skills required to become a patent associate? Uh, usually a master's degree in science or a bachelor's degree in engineering is required to become a patent associate. A PhD is not necessary, but again, it is ideal. Uh, one must mainly have a reasoning capability, 
creative thinking articulation writing skills clear communication diplomacy because you will be uh, i mean face in face to face conversation with lots of clients so you must have uh, diplomacy your language must be very polished uh, because while writing as well as while speaking it is very very important to have clear and good knowledge of english uh, while doing so and um, so these are the important uh, requirements to become a patent associate and you must have an inherent uh, interest in science a love for science uh, and a curiosity because the curiosity itself will make you question the inventor more get uh, more ideas get more concepts experimental data etc to strengthen the patent so it is a field that uh, keeps you on the edge at all the time because you know the current technology you keep uh, searching uh, the patent databases for what is happening in the world etc so it's a very uh, interesting field i would say what is the career path for a patent associate so in law firms usually uh, you start out as a patent associate and you will be a patent associate for about 4 to 5 years after which you become a senior patent associate and again continue for 4 to 5 years so as a senior patent associate you will be leading a team you will be uh, guiding uh um, junior patent associates as to how different things are done etc so there are not uh, too many fancy designations when you are in a law firm it's just a patent associate followed by being a senior patent associate and then you become the partner of the firm where you are involved in business development activities you get involved in more and more litigation so uh, your expertise as an attorney mostly comes into picture rather than your technical expertise and then this is the career path for a patent associate in ip firms and corporates so in ip firms you will have a lot of fancy designations in patents uh, you might start out as a patent associate technical associate or patent analyst uh, so one important difference is in law firms you will be expected to like expected to do everything patent search patent drafting prosecution post grant everything but uh corporates and ip firms have a more uh, organized and a structured way so as a patent analyst you will only be doing searches as a patent drafter you will only be doing patent drafting as a patent patent prosecutor you will only be doing patent prosecution so your uh, roles are more defined and structured and then uh, you go on to become a senior patent associate technical specialist senior patent analyst etc and then you become a lead and then you get into management roles so apart from law firms and ip firms there are in house ip cells also for example novozymes novo nordisk and biocon etc they have their in house ip cells uh, where they have uh, well qualified patent attorneys in the in house ip team uh, working on their products and processes here also you will have a, a number of uh, designations like an associate analyst ip manager strategic advisor etc so knowledge doesn't stop once you are a patent attorney and you have uh, gained a number of years of experience in the field you cannot be complacent because the times are changing uh, you should always uh, try to improve your knowledge uh, in terms of uh, various aspects like for example uh, learn how to use patent search tools like question orbit total patent sci finder and then using chemistry tools like chemdraw etc and have a certain knowledge on patent laws of various jurisdiction now there is an exam called as patent agent exam that happens uh, every year to qualify as a registered uh, patent agent in india that is when your signature holds value when you sign as a patent agent in a patent document it is recognized anywhere so that is an important exam to qualify then uh, you can go on and do your llb degree it is again not mandatory if you are not interested in pursuing law one need not do an llb degree uh, but i would say it is better that you do an llb degree because then you can slowly venture out from patents uh, into industrial designs trademarks copyrights etc and get into the other fields of ip as well and uh, most importantly as a patent attorney don't uh, you are not restricted to one field because inventions don't happen only in biosciences they happen in telecommunications in electrical uh, field in mechanical field etc so develop the competence to be able to read patent documents of various fields 
uh, and uh, try to expand your knowledge. Uh, like, just know about patterns that are in the pharma field, in the chemistry field, not just restrict yourself to the biotechnology field. So, and then after an LLB degree, uh, you can, there's an exam called as the Bar Council of India exam. You can uh, uh, do that as well. And uh, as I said, uh, develop the ability to work on patent application and other technical fields, such as material science, oil and gas, mechanical, telecommunication, electronics, etc. cetera. Uh, then slowly develop the taste for patent litigation, understand what happens in patent litigation, acquire knowledge on uh, trademarks and industrial designs. Uh, now, artificial importance has uh, come in every field and so has it come in the intellectual property field as well. Uh, many of our clients are using AI for uh, drug discovery, uh, optimization of gene, gene therapy, uh, etc. So try to acquire some knowledge on AI and data analytics as well. So I would like to conclude by saying that this is a techno-legal field, and uh, if you have interest in uh, pursuing this field, then you are very uh, free to uh, reach reach out to me, and I would be happy to answer your questions if any. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sunetra, for uh, nice presentation, and uh, she not only uh, gave uh, you know guidance to you all, she also introduced you to the IPR about patent, trademark, copyright, um, and many aspects like uh, some of the laws or uh, uh, sections where what can be patented, what cannot be, and how you can get the experience or how you can get training in order to become patent attorney. So thank you for that. And uh, I'm also happy that uh, in our syllabus, actually, at uh, JSS Academy of Air Education Research, uh, Division of Biochemistry, we have included one um, a paper, one subject exclusively for uh, bioethics research and IPR. That's good to know. So they are going to study that. Yes, uh, that gives a lot of, you know, uh, for the students uh, what, an yeah. idea about uh, what can be next. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sunetra, for uh, giving a nice presentation. And uh, I would like to ask the students, I uh, mean, the participants, uh, to let us know what questions, what, like, which are the free databases to read about latest patents? So the best database is Google Patents. That's the free database. And uh, there, are, uh, there is something called as uh, Free Patents Online. That is also a free database. Uh, we use paid uh, databases like Total Patents, Questel Orbit, etc. Uh, we cannot rely only on a free uh, database because we'll miss out a lot of patents. But uh, if you want to see what is happening in the field, then just go to Google Patents and uh, type in the keywords and you will get a list of patents in that particular technology. Okay. Uh, okay, I really appreciate how uh, Sunetra spoke about applications of what she has studied in other fields. Uh, she appreciated that she loved your talk and uh, uh, thanks for that. So. If Thank any you. questions uh, arises, uh, definitely we will um, uh, send it across uh, to Sunetra so that uh, we can get the answers. And uh, due to shortage of time, and we are running out of time. And uh, you see, uh, if we get a questions, I uh, definitely will pass it on to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sunetra, for accepting our invitation and to be part of uh, this webinar. And uh, you are a great example. To me. To me, yes, definitely, because it's an hardcore biochemist becoming, you know, uh, finding a job in patent, um, filing the authority, and then showing others, yes, there is, you know, uh, the way other than uh, previously, there's only this much. So, but 
thank you so much uh, sunetra for being with us thank and, you thank uh, you i would so i would request the next um, speaker ashok dangal i hope he already joined actually joined long ago yeah. so <laughs> good morning ashok yeah uh, good morning from and, uh, brisbane how are you doing sir <laughs> yeah i'm good so let me introduce you to our uh, participants sure. yeah so i know you yes, said uh, since uh, 2007 or 6 i think 6 or 7 because he was uh, a master degree student uh, in the department of uh, biochemistry university of mysore yeah your manasa gangotri and he actually um, they had one uh, house rented where we used to go ah. and uh, watch ipl <laughs> in 2008 so we used to uh, to gather yashad uh, and other um, nepali yeah. friends they please so uh, okay with that he actually graduated from university of mysore in 2011 it's 2000 and then, uh, he moved to nepal it's 2009 Yes, two thousand nine. That's fine. Uh, yeah. I remember in Bogadi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in two thousand eleven. No, no, no. Sorry, then, uh, I graduated in two thousand nine. So two thousand seven to two thousand nine. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. I think uh, there was. Yeah, a that's a that's a, that's a typo. So, yeah. And, yeah. So he moved to Nepal and worked as lecturer in biochemistry and also hospital biochemist. at KST Medical College Nepal and but during this um, instinct of lectureship he did lose the you know interest in research i was actually following him as a, even even though he was in academic he used to like you know publish articles he used to write review book chapters and um, he has Then, uh, like he has publication around more than uh, around twenty, I think. Uh, I saw that, and he is he is also having two to three book chapters, and that showed I think um, you know the lot of interest in him regarding Pyrogana. So then he joined uh, as for for his uh, PhD program at uh, the, the University of Queensland, Australia. So he is pursuing his PhD right now. so you may think that oh then this means uh, the in terms of his uh, career in a phd he is still in phd but he has lot of experience as a teaching faculty and then and he has traveled through and uh, uh, see the transition like being being student next becoming teacher and again becoming student so he is uh, doing uh, good in his uh, research and is publishing constantly and his research fo- focus is discovery of pharmacological characterization structure function relationship and rational design of pyruvanum peptide that targets voltage gated sodium channels involved in pain and epilepsy with an aim to develop a drug lead see look at that voltage gated sodium channel for ms students if you uh, recall Uh, you have paper card cell signaling, and where I yeah. teach um, for most of the you know sig- signaling, and we already learned ion channels also one of the way through which the signal can be operated. So the good that uh, Yashad Dangal is also working as, in that area, and um, I requested him uh, to be here and present. Uh, he accepted, and uh, I'm grateful to him, and I'm, I thank uh, Yashad for being here, and I welcome uh, you to deliver your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah, I'll just share my screen now. Yeah. Yeah, please.
So can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Siddha sir, and the organizing committee for providing me this opportunity uh, to share my career journey from being a biochemistry graduate and you know, to a Venom enthusiast now. Uh, before I start, uh, I'd like to put a disclaimer because like, it seems that I am the only speaker, as you mentioned, who is on the same boat as that of the target audience now. So rather than providing any expert advice from my side, I would say that I would share the lessons that I've learned from my life and that life has given to me. So yes, my name is Yashad and I'm working on spider venom peptide in Lewis Group at Institute of Molecular Bioscience in the University of Queensland. So let's begin with a simple and common questions we all have faced and hate it probably the most. So what is the aim in your life? So what's your plan after BSc or MSc or PhD? Or do you want to pursue your career in research or in academia or in industry? So do you have a concrete answer to these questions? If yes, do you have a concrete plan of actions as well? So the answer decides your way forward. So ask more and more questions like what, when, why, and where, which and how. So you know that five W's and H. So it's, a, it's also called the Socratic method of learning. So where you ask questions, where do we teach learn uh, using a question and answer method. So I'll tell you a real story of mine. So, which I remember. So back in 2005, I applied for a grant to set up a library in my village. I was discussing it with my senior in a youth organization. He started asking me like questions which sounds insane to me. So he was asking like, uh, why do you want to establish the library? Why do you want people to read newspapers, magazines, or literatures? And what happens if they don't read? How many people uses the library? So on and so on. So at last, he told me, you have to ask 1,001 such questions to yourself and get the answer. Then only your applica application will have the chance to get through. So this was an eye-opening statement to me, which I still remember. So we all should realize, therefore, the power of questioning. So the next question from my side to the audience is, do you open the door of opportunity and enter, or do you enter whichever door is open to you? Just have a think of it. So now the next question is, if you have an idea or goal or purpose of life, do you analyze them? So here I'm showing you two approaches, like one is the smart approach and short analysis. So these are probably basics in corporate and NGO, INGO world. Not sure if science curriculum teaches these things today, but certainly not when I was studying. So I learned them in a youth organizations programs. So it's a good idea to check the viability of your idea by smart approach and short analysis. So just ask if your idea specifically addresses the issue, whether the results or outcomes can be measured or seen, or are you efficient enough to achieve the objectives, or is it worthy to pursue, and can you achieve the outcomes in a given time frame? So try to analyze your idea plan with this approach and see if it is becoming, like if it's been benefiting or not. So another tool is SWOT analysis which calculates the strength, weakness, opportunities, and threat of your idea. The concept of this analysis is to increase the strength and opportunities while lessening the weakness and threat so that your idea, project, or dream, whatever, becomes successful in the end. So it is said, and I also believe, that powerful ideas sounds crazy or insane. So if these words are too harsh, you can soften it and ask if the idea is novel or is it interesting? 
So if you are aware of these two techniques we just discussed, it would be relatively easier to you to make a career decision. So, but I assume that it's not the case for most of us, if not all. So when I look back, I see lots of factors that affected my choice, that affected my choice of subjects. So let's begin from the very first, on the uh, left-hand side in your screen. I was a good student at school and I scored over 80% in 10th grade. 10th grade. So what am I supposed to study now in 10 plus 2? So obviously it's science, right? So this is the subject which leads to studying the most appreciated subjects like medicine and engineering. So let's go to the second point. I, I studied, I joined uh, plus two science after this. So let's go to the second point. So here I chose biology because simply I didn't like maths. So I didn't know if I primarily liked biology, but for sure I did not like maths. So the another factor is the peer pressure or trying new things. But uh, trying new things. So by nature, I am less interested. I mean, the another factor is the peer pressure. So this is something that you know I never fail into the peer pressure. So because by nature, I'm less interested to do the things that has been done by others. Instead, I like to explore the things, new things. So that is how I made friendship with uh, biochemistry. Sometimes uh, you choose something because you are really passionate about it. And I think this is the ideal case. So if you like some subject and you have chosen it, it's the best thing, I think. But it's not always the case for everyone. So if you are passionate about something and you are into it, it, what could be better than this? So another factor is uh, the availability of the subject and affordability of the subject. So I wanted to do my MSc on PhD in medical or clinical biochemistry, but availability and affordability was an issue to me. So, and at the same time, I got this scholarship, which ended up me doing MSc in biochemistry and PhD in venom science. So probably same or similar factors are still considerable in our setting. So while making a career choice. Uh, let me elaborate a bit more on why I chose to study biochemistry. Uh, we have to go back to year 2002. At that time, after my 10 plus 2, I was preparing for a medical entrance and accidentally I come across an advertisement of BSc biochemistry course. And it was a new course in the town, so just two years old. And by nature, I like trying try to do new things. So I was, and I was also fascinated by the way the program coordinator explained me about biochemistry. And I found it a powerful substitute to study, a powerful substitute to studying medicine. So I enrolled the course. And, and it's good thing with that course is this course gave me the first research exposure in the form of student project. So which I did it in a hospital and my cases were the third trimester pregnancy. So by the end of the course, all these exposures and everything, I had a dream to be a biochemistry faculty in a medical school. There is something I cherish about this undergrad project. So students at that time, generally, they do project based on secondary data, but I was sure not to do any projects on secondary data and wanted to generate the primary data. So then I expressed my wishes to my teachers and hospital lab head. So they agreed to my idea. I wrote a proposal, uh, proved it from the gynecology department and um, from the medical superintendent of the hospital. So I had to convince the pregnant and her husband about the significance of the project, what I will benefit from the project and what they are going to benefit from the project and finally took their written consent. So I thoroughly enjoyed this process from conceptualization of the project to execution of the project. So when I look back now, I see that I have done few significant things which made this project successful. I have dared to walk a different path. 
and I was certain on what I want and what I don't want. And I, I have expressed myself, I have expressed my concern and sought the necessary help from the people who I can get the help from. Then I have made a plan, I prepared it and I executed it. This led to a successful, uh, my BSc undergrad project um, back in 2005. So what was the plan after BSc? Of course, like many of us, it's MSc and in Nepal, only two institutes scattered MSc biochemistry course with just four seats in total. So, and I was unlucky to be the first candidate in the waiting list. So the gap between my BSc and MSc, which amounts to around 1.5 years was quite depressing in terms of career concern. Lots of my friends changed their track. And in fact, only four of us out of 15 pursued MSc in biochemistry. The good thing is during that time was I was volunteering in a youth organization. So I was sort of engaged quite nicely and growing myself. So the luck came as uh, ICCR scholarships. Uh, it's an Indian government scholarship. We said Indian Council for Cultural Relations scholarship to study uh, MSc biochemistry at University of Mysore from 2007 to 2009. And this habit of involving and volunteering led me to volunteer in a PhD scholars project in Mysore. Uh, I do not know if that PhD scholar remembers it or not, but I do. And he is none other than the organizing secretary of this webinar, Sidesh sir, of course. So he, I still remember him showing me the column chromatography and dialysis, and I'm very honored to acknowledge him in such a widely viewed uh, scientific event today. So I, I really appreciate his attitude of transferring knowledge and skills to juniors. So further with great professors, PhD scholars, and research activities in the department, my interest in research was getting stronger day by day. By the end of MSc, I was able to fix my uh, PhD in snake venoms at ABCRI with Dr. Dhananjay, but uh, I had to drop that later after a couple of months because he has to move abroad for his uh, future endeavors. So I had to drop my PhD. So the reflection of my life during this 2006 to 2009 period are like at hard times, perseverance is something that life asks from you. And we need to involve ourselves in activities that adds value to our life and our career. And we should keep looking for the opportunities that takes us towards our dream. So how was my life in Mysore? So I really rejoiced that my life in Mysore University of Mysore that was very, very productive. I was groomed by great professors, a panel of six professors you can see at the center of the screen. And besides academics, we enjoyed the life as uh, Siddhisar just mentioned while introducing me. We enjoyed the life a lot in our department by involving ourselves in various extracurricular activities, which I believe is very, very crucial in a student's life for his overall development and growth. So what next after uh, MSc? This is now a major question in my life. I had to let go one opportunity of PhD, but I had a dream of being a faculty member in a medical school. And I worked on my first dream and I started applying in medical school. And I got the position of a lecturer in KIST Medical College in 2009. Here, I not only had dreams in my life, so I also had commitments. So that is to start a family. Whichever dream comes first, true. Whichever dreams comes true first, either dream one or dream two. So after getting my job, so, so after getting my job, like after four months of getting my job, I got married and started a family. So. The moral of the lesson is do not hesitate to dream. If you do not dream, you will certainly not get it. 
and keep up with your commitments. It is equally important. So here, commitment doesn't mean starting a family only, but it can be anything you have said, you'll do it. So just keep your words. When you have promised something, try to fulfill it as much as you can. So how was my tenure as a biochemist? Which is quite long. It's almost uh, nearly, like it's almost eight years. So yes, this was my first dream which got materialized and, and I had realized during this tenure that PhD is something very important in life science subjects like biochemistry, if we are doing some research and if we are staying in uh, teaching, learning and uh, research area. So there I was therefore exploring for the PhD opportunities. And I was successful to secure a PhD position at Nepal Academy of Science and Technology in 2010. And I dropped it because I wasn't happy with few terms and conditions. Similarly, uh, uh, Professor Cletus D'Souza from University, from Department of Biochemistry in University of Mysore, he was my professor, so he informed me of a PhD opportunities in GKVK in Bangalore. So which again, I did not, uh, which again did not proceed as uh, I wanted to, to look, I wanted to look for PhD in clinical biochemistry areas. So again, similarly, uh, another opportunity to do a PhD in snake venoms at uh, Chulalongkorn University in Thailand. Again, did not materialize uh, as there were uh, funding issues that could support my living. So I had to sacrifice few opportunities in PhDs. However, I was enjoying teaching medical and dental students. So, but you know, life, was asking for a change. At the same time, I was also collaborating with uh, other medical departments and like anesthesiology and gynecology and I was publishing. I co-received a grant together with the gynecology department to conduct uh, a study in gestational diabetes mellitus in 2013. And since my first publication in Venoms in 2012, I have now streamlined my a PhD search towards um, earlier I, I was like looking into clinical biochemistry, metabolism, and others areas. So after 2012, I, I I had a focus. Now I was attracted with some venom stuff, so I streamlined my PhD search towards venom. So and my second dream came true in 2017, and I joined Professor Richard Lewis Lab in Australia to pursue my PhD in venom pharmacology. When I retrospect those eight years, what I can say is when things keep repeating, it becomes boring, even if it is your dream. So, and second thing is we should not miss any opportunities to collaborate and we should keep moving forward. So before I joined PSD, I had published three book chapters, two invited reviews, one case report and co-authored nine research papers. I often get a question, why did I choose to study Venom? Even today, when I talk with other, other like uh, research students or research fellows from other groups, when we sit over the coffee and ask, they ask me, hey, Yashad, why do, did you choose Venom to study? To be honest, I graduate from the University of Mysore Biochemistry Department who works in the Venom, but I was not fascinated with Venom research until I noticed a hornet sting case in 2011 in a medical college hospital where I worked for. You can see uh, the hornet sting case here. So this is the hornets. So this, I, I saw this case in my medical college. I got curious about it. I followed it and I published it as a clinical case. And after a couple of publications, I became passionate on Venom studies and started looking for the opportunities. I was then regularly applying for the grants in University Grants Commission of Nepal and NAST, we say NAST, uh, it's a Nepal Academy of Science and Technology, which is an apex uh, body, apex government body uh, in the sector of science and technology. So my, but my grants were unsuccessful every year. My team, 
we then spent money from our own pocket to collect the hornets from its habitat. Now, you may ask a question, is it sensible to spend money from your pocket to do resource work? Maybe or maybe not, the answer depends. But what I agree is, it certainly is not a professional way. But in my case, this activity kept me motivated and I was publishing. I published five articles out of it. So, sorry. So here, what I did was, I did not miss any opportunity to get the real and firsthand experience. And I kept doing those activities that kept me motivated. So you may ask what happened with my Hornet Pro Venom project? Of course, it has to fail. It was a failure. When I checked my viability of the project with a smart approach and SWOT analysis, and it seems that failure is inevitable to that, that project. So my team was not efficient enough in terms of resource. We don't have any Venom labs in Nepal. So in terms of resources, in terms of funding, we were weak to achieve that goal, and which was a great threat to the project. And we could not lessen that threat anymore. So the project has to fail, it failed. But despite the failure of the project, it gave us five papers as a byproduct, which we are happy with, which we could use it, which I could use it later to apply for my PhDs and, and, and other things. So are there any more unsuccessful stories with me? Yes, of course, there are many, such as you know the Harnet Venom project failed, which I just mentioned. Others are my numerous grant applications at UGC and NAS, and my numerous PhD projects, my diagnostic laboratory startup, and I also was planning to start a hospital there in uh, Nepal, so it also did not materialize. And I was the founder of a Biochemist Association of Nepal, so uh, the organize, the, this, this association uh, organized uh, by a, a biochemistry, biochemistry conference in 2011. It's an international con conference of two days. So it also could not continue after uh, two years. So yes, this is also one of my um, unsuccessful stories or failure stories, I, I would say. And now, did I do anything except uh, curricular activities yes of course you can see the slide is it's it's full it's full of the list that i do something other than uh, my re, uh, regular academic activities so i participated in departments activities in kathmandu and mysore so i was the executive committee of a public speaking club uh, in 2006 7 i was a resource person and convener of a one-day workshop on HIV and AIDS, a social issue. So I was, I even did a research in public policy. So in 2008, when I was in uh, Mysore, so I went to Cochin. So there's a institute called Center for Public Policy Research, where I spent 18 days doing research on public-private partnership uh, for uh, sustainable development of uh, Cochin. So yeah, I did something non-science activities as well. And yes, uh, I was organizer of the conference, co-coordinator of KISS Medical College in the earthquake response team, so core group member and teachers training at KISS Medical College, involved in lots of other activities here. I was also the assistant editor in Nepal Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology for 2015 to 17 and editorial assistant now from 2017 in Journal of Nepal Health Research Council. So I was a reviewer for four journals as well. So yes, uh, what I emphasize here is now uh, volunteering grooms us and adds value in our CVs. So we should keep volunteering as well. So this, this makes me happy. So volunteering makes me happy when I look back. So you should keep volunteering as well. And so currently my life at University of Queensland observes like extensive lab work where my project focuses on discovery and characterization of venom. So peptide modulators, of, uh, venom peptide modulators of pain pathways and epilepsy. So our university is Australia is one of the prime institute that works on animal venom. 
So especially in spider venom and cone snails. So besides lab work, I keep presenting my work in scientific meetings, organize scientific events, get reward and celebrate every possible events that we could as a student. And yes, I, as I was reflecting back my life for this talk, I noticed a very important thing that I was maintaining. I have surrounded myself with great mentors who helped me in every possible way they could when I needed them. So Professor uh, Richard Lewis is my PhD supervisor. I benefited a lot from his academic and non-academic advisors. So the way he is responsive to students, trust them and mentors them is something I look forward to build in myself. So all you must know is Professor Kiltus D'Souza. So besides teaching biochemistry to me, he was my thesis supervisor and wrote me several recommendation letters without any delay. So whenever I asked, so his suggestions were very critical while preparing my research proposal. I am very fond of the way he keeps students in priority. He has got lots of imprints in my mind. So the one I would share is the zone of influence. So I remember him, tell, him telling us that it would not matter wherever we go or whichever career we pursue. We have to create a zone of influence. So no matter how big or small, we need to have one. So another is Professor Gopi Arial. So he's a great mentor who always listened to me patiently, motivated me when I was feeling low with my PhD applications and also facilitated me for PhD opportunities in Thailand. So without any hesitation, he supported my Hornet Venom project and my endeavors in Venom research with his best capacity. Next is Professor Amitas, who supported my extracurricular endeavors while I was working in a medical college. I share my issues and take advices with her regularly. And Dr. Thaninze, I've mentioned, so who I was supposed to begin my PhD with, has supported my endeavors in Venom publication until before I arrived to Australia for PhD. So he has forwarded me several opportunities and publication which I have utilized and has advised me whenever I ask. Another is Professor Ganesh Dangal has fulfilled my objective to get involved in journal's editorial team. He was very receptive when I first approached him to edit the Nepal Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2015. Since then, our as association is continuing and now uh, I'm associated in, in his team in Journal of Nepal Health Research Council. So we collaborate further in a couple of faculty research projects in his hospital. And yes, friends can also be our mentor, Arakis, who is my undergrad classmate. He's the first listener of my crazy ideas and supported my Venom endeavors. So what surprises me is that he comes up with solution whenever I discuss problems with him. So he's a great person. So why I'm showing this is, do you have guys have some great mentors surrounding you? It seems that more the better. So I'm grateful that I have remained surrounded by these great people. So now it's time to conclude, I think. So pretty much I have con concluded every slide. So I won't be repeating them again. So, you know, uh, repetition is boring. So, but I like to emphasize one thing out of the talk that is ask, ask, and ask. So it seems asking is a very powerful tool. And uh, another thing I'd like to say is give back when your turn comes. So Dr. Siddhis and organizing members are giving back to the fraternity through this webinar. So recently something good happened with me and I also had the opportunity to give back. I got an opportunity to facilitate the collaboration of my university's research group and Professor Gopi Arial in Nepal. So within four hours and with just four emails to and fro, the collaboration initiated. So which will benefit, I believe, the fellow Nepalese researchers back home. So let's give back when we have a chance to give back. So thus, I, I not over put anything in this slides. I want the people to put whatever you get from my uh, talk in this concluding slide. So it's up to you. And finally, yes, yep. I'd like to thank the, uh, I'm very grateful to the organizing committee for this webinar for providing me this opportunity to share my career path to fellow uh, students and Lewis group at the University of Queensland, which I'm affiliated to and my professors, uh, friends, family, colleagues, and mentors who have uh, directly and indirectly contributed to my career building. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yes. so thank you. Thank you very much, Yashad uh, Dungal. Uh, nice presentation and sharing your experience. And due to uh, running, uh, like shortage of time and yeah. we are running out, so the questions uh, uh, will be answered in uh, 
Q&A and I request uh, Yashad yeah. to answer. There is a, one or two questions uh, for you. So please um, answer. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm. Type the answers in the Q&A uh, section, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. No, again, thank uh, you very Yashad. much. Yeah. And, uh, thank you so much. So next, uh, I would uh, uh, request Raghuram to introduce Bharat Patan. To introduce and also I request Bharat Patan. And also I request Bharat Patan. Um, Hello. Hi. Hi, Hi, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. you are audible. Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. Uh, I take this uh, privilege, take this privilege uh, uh, to introduce my dear friend uh, Bharat. Um, uh, we were uh, uh, interacting during the uh, MSC days. And it uh, goes on to say that how we can collaborate for, across this discipline from IMC and Bharat was from genetics. Um, so talking about Bharat, he is an educator. Uh, there is a recording going on. Presently for the K10 uh, students uh, at An Academy, you might have heard about An Academy, a very famous brand. Uh, he is he was actually the senior uh, product developer uh, as well in Topper Technologies. Uh, subject matter expert in Next Education India, uh, various uh, roles he has played and also he started. I remember uh, him taking up the role of uh, product development associate uh, at Think and Learn uh, Private Limited, which is now popularly uh, uh, branded as Baiju's. Um, and uh, he has been into a lot of roles, uh, specifically with respect to teaching as well as, as, well as uh, scientific writing as well. Um, uh, so uh, it is our... Uh, a privilege that uh, we have him over here to talk about the present trend of education uh, mm -hmm. with the edutech component being popularized uh, and with this pandemic situation as well it is right time to address uh, these uh, uh, issues as well so over to you bharat uh, thank you uh, thank you Raghu. Uh, it's been a long time i have uh, you know met a lot of you guys uh, i'll share my screen now um, Yeah, the screen is visible, you may... Yeah, okay. So uh, thank you everyone for giving an opportunity to, uh, you know, talk on this uh, particular uh, topic before. Uh, I'm not audible. Yeah, now you are audible, now you are audible. Uh, am I audible now? Is it is it audible? Just a minute. You are audible. I'm audible now. Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. Cool. So, uh, uh, okay. So, why am I here? Because you know, EdTech in EdTech has something which has boomed in the last a decade, I would say, and it is something uh, very. It's it's an it's an opportunity that is op opened up for a lot of uh, you know uh, graduates. Not I'm not. It's just not uh, restricted to life science graduates. Even other subjects can also you know use this. But um, since we are focusing on life science, and I am from life science, life science, I'll just give an introduction. Basically, what I have done. So uh, uh, <laughs> my friend here has given me a little bit of introduction. So I have done my masters in genetics. From from Mysore University, and then I worked for three years in Baijus, uh, and you know I was I have done quite a different different roles over there. I'm not going to go into the details of what I have done, uh, but I do want to tell you. So when I did my masters, I had an idea that I will be doing research and everything. And when I did research, I realized that I'm not too keen on doing research. So what opportunities do you have? You know if. You, so I want all of you to understand that after you do your master's, research is a very good option if you are interested. Not everyone needs to be interested in research. Okay, And if you do not have, share that passion of doing research, that does not mean you have you know, somehow been a failure. That means that you need to find something else. And uh, during my process of finding what I want to do, I came across ed education and it did not happen, you know, automatically. Uh, there is something, a small part uh, that, uh, you know, is probably not there in my CV because it goes very long if I had everything, is that I actually worked in a media company for six months. I used to write articles on Canada film industry. That is what I started off as, you know, because I wanted to write. I did not know what I wanted to write, but I just wanted to write something. So I started off doing 
doing that. Then, uh, then uh, a couple of, couple of my friends were working in this uh, Baiju's classes. It used to be called as Baiju's classes at that time. And my friend said, you know what? Uh, we are hiring people who can write content for biology and all. And, and you, you seem to be interested in biology. Why don't you try it out? And that is how my journey with EdTech started. And I, it's been three years in Baiju's. Then I worked with Next Education and Topper Technologies. Topper is also another uh, uh, you know, uh, learning app just almost similar to Baiju's. And currently, I am working as an educator with an academy. It's, I mean, it's almost, uh, you know, uh, everybody knows about an academy now, thanks to the IPL ads and everything. Now, let us let us first go. Why do we? Uh, why edtech? What is the importance of edtech? That's the first thing I want to talk about. Now, first thing is it makes education accessible to a lot of people. I remember as a student, okay, I, I was pretty bad at maths. I, I barely scrapped through my maths in my 12th standard exam. It was so bad for me. And uh, when, I, when I thought about, was I bad at it? Was I not uh, good enough to write maths? And I realized that actually, no, I, my teacher was not, uh, you know, he was not able to get through to me. I'm not going to blame him, but it happens sometimes that some educators may not be able to uh, get certain concepts to you. So what do you need at that time? You need to find another educator who can actually uh, come to your level and teach. Now, staying in Mysore, I mean, you, you, we can say it's 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 a, a you know growing town and everything. But I'm talking about you know 2005, 2006. I did not have access to the best educators. Plus, I was from the CBSC stream, so uh, there was a huge change between the state syllabus and the CBSC, and I did not have very good educators. So. I struggle with what is called as, you know, the small town, uh, uh, you know, disabilities. Small town people do not get access to the best educators in India. Now, this is what EdTech is breaking. It is allowing, today I am I am teaching to students who are sitting in, you know, I have a student from Meerut, I have a student from Ghaziabad, I have a student from uh, somewhere in, in, in Bihar, I have students somewhere in Tamil Nadu, all over India. I had I had once even, uh, one student had come even from Pakistan. I, I, I was like surprised. That is what EdTech does. It makes education accessible to everyone and quality education. That is what every student aspires for, right? Now, um, and next, what, what does EdTech bring into the table? It also brings a fresh perspective. You do not have to listen to what your teacher always teaches. See, this is something that I very honestly believe is that uh, teaching is, is very subjective. What if I teach something to a couple of students, it may or may not uh, get through to the student. Uh, why? Because it is subjective. Some people understand concepts in some way. Another student will have another way of understanding. So uh, what EdTech does is it brings a new perspective. We try to bring in visualizing, visualizing aids and everything, which is basically what I want to point over here. Visualization of your concepts. You know, you show a protein docking mechanism or you show how DNA will split, you know, how it will split and how the DNA may start to replicate. Now, sitting at uh, sitting in the classroom, trying to visualize what is happening may happen in some students, may not happen. Please understand that not everyone is creative. Some people are creative, some people are not. So uh, it, it creates a much more impact on a student. And I have seen students who, who, who clearly understand, uh, you know, uh, some com complex mechanisms in biology when I show them some visual aids, because it is, it is understood that visual aids are far more impacting to a student rather than just, you know, simple text and, and, and uh, uh, you know, rote learning. And then lastly, EdTech makes education very personalized okay you the app basically that is what i was doing in byus okay i was creating personalized learning i used to create i used to break down chapters into into concepts then i used to connect uh, the the concept i used to make a concept chart i used to add questions i used to connect the questions to the concepts then i used to connect the co concepts to the videos so all what what was happening is students will keep on you know, taking up practice questions. And when the student falters, the app 
using their uh, you know all uh, uh, ai they would understand okay the student is faltering in these concepts so let me try and you know edge, uh, try and help them out that is called as personalized learning now personalized learning is quite difficult in a, a normal uh, school setting but using an app which only you will use will create a sort of uh, you know there will be a lot of data which is mined from your work I know there are there are concerns about data breach and everything, but still, this is all about education. What we are trying, so we try to understand how the student is studying, how they are, you know, understanding the concepts. What is the learning gaps? We try to under, understand what is the learning gap in the students, and that will help help us to teach them better. Now, these personalizations are very much uh, unique and very much uh, a very uh, unique thing about the edtech, uh, you know, space. And I I do not know how much of this is possible in a, in a in a classroom setting because honestly i have not taught a lot in the a lot in the classroom and if if you have a classroom filled with you know 50 60 70 students it becomes a lot more difficult to have such kind of personalization and fun learning now what the next thing i want to talk is what are the different types of edtech industries this comes as a little bit of a uh, you know surprise to a lot of things like ed tech that is just one thing no it is just education technology no there are different facets to the ed tech industry now first one as i mentioned is the learning gap that is what your uh, companies like byju's topper and i think even a couple of other companies like uh, i'm not not remember the name there are a couple of other companies which are offering this obviously the 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 biggest market leading leader is uh, your byju's and then there is topper which is which is coming second now the learning app is basically where you where you create videos you create questions you create a personalized learning experience there is a lot of complex uh, uh, you know uh, machine learning which is happening in the background so you need to have a very good tech team also there you also need uh, you know motion graphic designers you need you need artists you need 3d artists a lot of things are needed for making a learning app and this is um, you know so what is the what is the avenue where you guys can come in so in a learning app as i told you there there will be conceptual videos who makes these conceptual videos it is guys like you and me we know biology we know our our subject now it does not mean that you you have to be if from msc zoology or msc botany or anything irrespective of what is your uh, uh, you know uh, what is your uh, uh, any, any whatever is your MSc stream, if you are good at your subject, if you are good at biology, then it is something. It's a, it's an opportunity that you can explore. But what do you need? What are the skill sets you need? First thing, you need to be very good at writing. Okay, writing is something which does not come naturally to everyone. For some people, it comes naturally. For some people, they develop it. Now, you need to decide whether you can write or whether you can develop this skill. But if you can develop this skill, then uh, it is it's definitely a very good opportunity that you can always look into. And, uh, you know, you have to write a lot of scripts. You have to add in a lot of uh, fun elements. That's also a very important part of, of your learning, uh, of your uh, process, by the way, because just writing scripts is not in import, it's not enough. You need to make sure that the whatever you are conveying, you see, there are small kids who will be watching the videos that you are going to write. Your, your target audience are small kids, and you need to be 100% sure that whatever you're writing is easily understood by those kids. And that is your goal. So make it fun, make it crisp, do not add unnecessary boring concepts, make, come to the point and try to make, make sure that your script has a lot of visual aids to it. So if you can add a lot of visual uh, uh, you know, part into your, into your subjects, then it becomes easier for the students to understand. Then along, along with that, you also have the, the uh, there are a lot of other processes that comes in the learning app. Uh, you know, the learning app also has, you also need to understand how to break down concepts. You need to understand how to connect concepts. Uh, you also should be able, to, you should also be very good at creating questions. Creating questions is a very underrated uh, skill, by the way. Okay, uh, I, I have seen so many people who struggle. I personally am not very, uh, you know, I'm not very fond of making questions, but I do like, but, but if I get time and if I have, you know, uh, some, uh, if I'm in the mood, I, re I really enjoy making questions because 
asking a good intriguing question makes the student try to understand the subject even more so your if your questions are of the highest quality it enhances the product in a much much better way okay so that's one more skill that is needed so these are the skills for the learning gap then what is the other type of industry tech industry that is the hands on learning with experimental models now this is something that i have never ventured into because i i knew that this uh you know the experimental model needs a very high level of creativity okay you are creating a uh, small small experiments you are creating a fun learning experiment for for your for the children this needs creativity and you obviously you need uh, you know the uh, you need to have the knowledge of of the subject but subject knowledge along with creativity that is what creates the experimental model uh, the thing with this type kind of time type of industry is that i do not know any uh, uh, any such industry which has made a huge impact as such most of these uh, com companies who do these experimental models they usually do a tie up with some school or they tie up with uh, you know some uh, 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 some other tech industry that is what they do and i'm not very very uh, you know uh, i'm not very sure of how exactly the scope is of this industry because so many so many companies have been trying to get a foothold on this and i don't see any company which is making something really really uh, breakthrough product there is no breakthrough product that has come so far maybe in future it might we do not know that then the last one is definitely the online coaching class now online coaching class has boomed like crazy it has boomed okay i i remember when i started uh, online coaching uh, i was i started off with proper technologies they started they started the online teaching and they said uh, my manager told me hey bharat do you want to try try online teaching i said i was not really very interested in the in the script writing for a while so i said um, i i do want to try out something else so, so when the online coaching started they said why don't you try teaching and i tried it was fun uh teaching was really fun so when i started off i used to have 30 40 50 students in my class and when that was march to 2020 when the lockdown started and i started off the new batch i had 500 600 700 800 students there was one time when my server crashed because i had 1000 plus students in my class that is the number of students i was teaching you cannot even imagine doing that in a normal class okay teaching 1000 students in one session that is what the the, the technology uh, enables you you are reaching 1000 students at a time is unimaginable uh, you know at an, an, any condition but that is what uh, you know online coaching brings into you now it can be quite chaotic let me be honest it can be chaotic but once you get the hang of how to deal with so many students and how to go ahead you know it's most mostly about you delivering the content and uh, trying to pick up the most important doubts that is how you go about with the online coaching it's it's, it's not easy let me be honest okay it's it's slightly tricky in the beginning but once you get the hang of it it is really fun teaching online it uh, so that's that's the sec that's the third type of uh, industry which is there and on online coaching has i would say it is it has a very bright future mostly because right now we are again stuck at home because of the covid and there is no out uh, you know we cannot go to any any brick and mortar coaching institute where we go to a classroom and teach so online coaching is the go every schools have adopted when i was with topper um, there were schools which had tied up with topper to provide an online uh learning platform you know zoom had its own uh problems in the beginning there were students who were creating new sense and everything so uh, we so many edtech platforms decided to create exclusive learning platform for schools so the school teachers could come and teach the students it would be just like what uh, happens on youtube so i teach and the teach children will be there but there will be a lot more control than what is there in the youtube youtube has no control but uh, on, on a particular learning platform there will be a lot more control given that's the thing so yeah so this is what the opportunities that is there for you guys you can do content creation content creation uh, is fun you need to be slightly creative on that um, uh, you need to have the ability to write because 
a person who hates writing would not be someone who would be uh, fit for content creation let me be honest okay then you can also do curriculum designing a uh, little more uh, different from uh, content what do you do in curriculum designing you have to decide how a student is going to learn there are there are a lot of uh, companies for example lead school uh, the lead school is one of the biggest uh, player in that market they they are one of the premier uh, curriculum designing companies they design curriculum for so many uh, schools all over india why why would a school depend upon upon a company because your your job in such a company would be to design curriculum in such a way that it becomes a lot more fun there will be activities involved in this you need to decide what all content you are going to include you need to decide what uh, uh, you know what would be the methodology methodology of of teaching all that is designed by the curriculum the curriculum designing person then obviously the last thing which is the online teaching so these are the opportunities you have as a life science graduate obviously as you keep on working you will you will you will go from on content creation to someone someone who will be managing so that is what i was doing in byju's so i started off with content creation then i started off managing the students and managing the juniors who came so they they would create content i had to make sure i had to do a quality check i had to make sure that what the work they did doing was good, good enough so these were all different different uh, you know as you go ahead with the edtech industry you will in Increase, you will go up, and you will have more responsibilities that will be coming uh, across you. So, what is the future? Now, as I mentioned in my in my title, is opportunities and impact. What is the what is the impact of uh, edtech? we cannot take edtech very lightly it, it is one it is one of the biggest uh, see education market is one of the biggest it is it is poised to reach 7 trillion dollars uh, by 2025 to put in perspective india's economy is 2.9 i think 2.9 trillion dollars that is double the amount of india's uh, uh, you know uh, gdp that is how big the education market is so if you are someone who is interested in, in education if you are interested in uh, you know not going for research but rather for, for education please do not take this industry lightly it is the future and i am not trying to rub salt or anything but i saw i i used to go to linkedin i used to see so many people saying that they lost their job and something there was one industry which did not get affected by covid it was the edtech industry rather edtech industry literally made billions they they screamed money <laughs> during the covid pandemic because everybody wanted a a uh, piece of that pie so uh, that is that is one one positive thing that that i experienced during the although it's a, it's a very horrific pandemic that we are going through but that was something that it was very very surprising right and uh, you know ed tech startups are now becoming unicorn unicorn means the valuation goes above 1 billion dollar so so the future is extremely bright if you are interested this is the industry you should really be looking into start as soon as you are done with your education and you know go forward and make sure that you are you know uh, uh, there and lastly i just want to tell you uh, please do not devalue the traditional school uh, even till today brick and mortar schools do not have any substitution we can say ha huh, online is done online education is happening all that is there but once we get through this pandemic and we will the the brick and mortar schools are going to come back into the picture it is not going anywhere edtech is still in its infancy we do not have a valid uh, you know alternative for the for traditional schools what we are trying to do edtech is basically becoming a tool it is becoming a tool to you know synergize the already present education system you know companies like akash educations akash classes they have been brought up they have been taken over by byju's for 1 billion dollar why did byju's take over akash because they realized that there has to be some amount of synergy between the the edtech and the traditional coaching or the traditional school both of them go hand in hand it cannot be an alternative it is something which brings the two uh, 
industries together. That is that is what uh, I have understood in my last six to seven years of the uh, edtech industry. So with that, I will be finishing my uh, uh, note. I'm not going to talk too much. So uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Siddesh sir. Uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Raghuram. Uh, it was pleasure talking with all of uh, you know presenting my views of the edtech with all of you. Hopefully you would you would have got some insight. If you have any doubts, you I think uh, Raghuram he will going to share my uh, LinkedIn, uh, you know, link. You can join. You can you can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. You can talk to me. I'll try my best to guide you because it is one of the best, uh, you know, industry which has come up in the last decade. And I want to see more and more life science students coming up, showing interest, and and becoming a part of this uh, wonderful industry. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Bharat, for that uh, very crisp talk. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure you'll be getting all the questions in the Q&A section. Yeah. And uh, we'll be listening. To, uh, we'll, uh, and it is well documented as well, and so that yeah. all can access of it. As well. Sure. Thank you once again for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Bharat. Thank you. Thank you so much, folks. <laughs>
Yes. You need to click on PPT first. I did that. Okay. You are apparently sharing the entire screen, actually. Uh, you may share the window of uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Go to share. Sharing option. Share the screen. Click yeah, share the screen and, and then the windows. Uh, just clicking and then... No, no, you, you need to first uh, open your PPT. Open your PPT first. Okay. First open your PPT. Then uh, go there. Uh, share. Start with the share. Okay. Share screen. Yeah, can uh, you yes, see my screen right visible. now? Uh, make it big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we, are, we can. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for make that. So how can we make a difference with each other that we should brand ourselves? So branding is nothing but uh, say that if we just take an, um, uh, uh, any uh, beverage um, as an example. So we just come to know about a new uh, set of uh, beverages which has been introduced by Pepsi. For, um, the, for example, uh, if we just take how we come to know about the launch is by uh, we see an ad in a uh, TV or in a poster kind of thing. So uh, we also have, so an other company, how will that come to know that we are there for the requirement? It is just by we need to brand uh, uh, ourselves. Uh, actually, sorry if you have a, any uh, background as such, because I do have a small baby at home. She keeps crying. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, for that, what do we need to do is sell yourself. So how do we need to sell uh, ourselves is by uh, ensuring that we actually give uh, the skill sets or exposure, whatever we do get to to get to know to the company saying that okay i am there in the market if you want me please hire okay so how can we do that so the first step is by making a resume so that is what i'm i'm going to talk about uh, in my first section so that is uh, how can so what a critical uh, i uh, you get a lot of in information in the internet at the, about how do we make a resume or what are the critical things I need to do when I'm, in, I'm the, the making a resume. So I'm not going to touch um, the whole thing, uh, but I would like to give you a glimpse or a tips and tricks of uh, about resume making. Okay. Uh, most importantly, there are few basic sub parts of a resume. So first is the you need to give your contact section. I think uh, this has been touched in our previous uh, presentations also, uh, uh, where uh, Miss Kanya was actually the I mean the presenting the same thing. So, but basically try to put at least the things like name, address, even that right now the trend of putting the photographs has has also become a new normal. And uh, email and also the link uh, um, that LinkedIn uh, profile link so that the um, uh, hiring uh, company or the hiring person can actually go to your LinkedIn profile and then see what all things you have written. And nowadays, even uh, we can also uh, tell the people to write about us on the LinkedIn profile. So when an uh, interviewer reads those things, so 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 he feels that okay, this. Uh, I mean, that is genuine recommendation, uh, which actually, I mean, I mean th that is considered as that. After that, uh, we need to have a professional or also the career objectives. So this career objectives is like at least write around three to four sentences about what you feel about your um, uh, design or how do you see yourself in the next five years or what do you expect? from the company or from yourself and what you can give and other than that uh, the next year experience so experience uh, for the people who have an industrial experience or the past experience they will just put their experience but for the freshers what can we put as an experience right so for that whatever the project uh, you have done during your curriculum that you can actually put it 
or if you have done any summer camps or any six months training program that you can actually put it and that will give you an extra mileage to i mean the, to the resume so that is where i keep telling to my juniors or uh, the people whom i know that whenever you have a ambient time please do attend some of the training program which uh, where you feel of more of interest and then where you feel that like you can actually develop uh, over that yeah and next is the edu that education part so so the education you can actually put uh, uh, from uh, 10th 12th and then the degree and also the master degrees but once you get on to an experience like around 5 to 6 years of experience then you just take a take o take only the degree marks in i mean the degree percentage um into the cv the next coming uh, to that it is a skill or the competency uh, the main challenge is for the freshers for you guys when you when you want to apply so what you should put because as me because as i have more than around 12 years experience now so i, I can just put all the um uh, instruments i have uh, i have handled i have learned but for you guys so what are so what are skills and competency like it might be as simple as handling a spectrophotometer or as simple as uh, handling a ph meter or in uh, so what are the uh, critical instrument like you if you have handled a pca so whatever you have handled in your project work or in your curriculum you can actually put that but once you put it you should know the main principle of it because the interviewer which will surely be concentrating on this critical part where he might ask ask you the questions and next about the personal uh, details and nowadays that reference is only on demand because uh, you don't want to uh, increase your resume uh, pages just by putting the references if they really ask you then you can actually uh, on demand and other sections are an added at ad the that advantages like you can put the award or achievements which you have um, uh got and the paper publications if you have any any and if you have um that attended any uh, international or national symposiums and what the different languages just for example just say if, if a profile uh, needs um where you need to travel to some different different countries then if you know uh, like uh, french or spain or any other language so that will really um so that will might be a point of selection during that time and uh, hobbies yes that will also um, sometimes it it's also good to tell that okay i do singing i do dancing i do i do something else and if you have a community service like if you if you are involved in nss so those, those can also be included yeah so now i will just come to a part where the few critical things you need to really take care yeah one is before making a resume you need to please list down what are the competencies you have don't uh, try to write whatever it is there in the online uh, portal now for this i would uh, so for this what you should have is you need to make a swot analysis swot analysis means a strength weakness opportunity and the threat so what you need to is so what you are going to reflect in your uh, resume making is the strength okay right so so the strength is so what you already have okay what you are good at say you are just uh, good at uh, communications or talking to people or you are a team worker then you should actually reflect those things in in your resume and coming to the weaknesses like okay i am i am not uh, it a talkative person or i take some time to interact so those things like uh, okay i i am an individual thinker i am a very very uh, because i take sense so those things you should not reflect in your resume but you should start working on it and where you have an opportunity that uh, you see that this job role needs this nowadays uh, uh, like uh, nowadays the handling of hplc is an trend so the lot of companies prefer hpl handling people with hplcs then what i do is so okay um i do have an uh, that analytical skills or analytical thoughts but i am not handle the hplc so i will just ensure that i will i will also look for opportunity to learn or get in training under hplc and then i will up, apply to that okay and next year threat where you uh, even 
you don't know anything about that so those things you actually ensure that say like um there is a job role which actually ask about uh um handling of uh, mass spec i don't have any idea about that okay and i will not apply for a job there because if even if i apply then i i know that uh, i will not be able to handle so but i will i will just keep that a point and uh, uh, if i have time of any any training so i will ensure that i will just go and attend attend to that so this is the skill. so just list down that and the strength whatever you have just try to incorporate in when you are when you are making a resume yeah next we all know that there are uh, google is a uh, store uh, uh, storehouse or a power pack data right whatever you want it you will actually get it yeah so search for an resume format which actually which you like it but you have to keep that as an inspiration right uh, and create and try to create your own profile because you have to look unique because see because i am in an industry and if if we publish an uh, job portal in any of the website usually for one position we get around 500 to 600 different resumes okay in that 500 to 600 resumes only one will be get when one will be getting selected who looks unique right and resume is the first step where you look unique right because the people have not talked to you the people have not interacted with you but what they see you is a resume for this i would like to give you an example there is a scenario okay there is there are two friends one is a male and uh, and also a female okay the female has actually um hello yes sir you are audible you may continue actually the yeah you are audible now you may yeah so sorry so for this i would i would like to give an example where there are two friends one is a male and another is a female uh, the the male boy actually uh, wants to make a resume because he he found that there i mean that there is an opening uh, in in a company so then he just asked his friends saying that can you please uh, give me a format of resume because i wanted to apply for this job uh, then uh, she forwards to him and then he just up updates accordingly and then send it to the company and uh, he got a call from the company so he has applied for so he went to the uh, interview and the moment he just entered to the interview panel the interviewer was shocked to see him do you know why because in that resume it was written as a female in the personal details yeah so this accidents do happen when you are not clear clear or uh, you are not going through all the things so that's why i would like to uh, say that yes you take the in inspiration from other resumes but uh, you have to make your own profile make your own resumes so that whatever it is there it's you yeah and the uh, next point is uh, next is highlight the non tech so because in our resume we just write i know i do handle this instrument i know handle this instrument i have done this project but there are some of the non technical tasks like i do have my strengths like communication is my strength because in a team when because if a manager if he wants to have a very good team he need a person who who is in lab who is uh, who that who can manage a people then he can actually make make him a project leader and uh, who can i mean that uh, a good communicator and a, a person who actually follows the real sop so it's not like a person will be will is known for everything right it is just like if i just tell my computer to just to go around and then swipe the floor then he will not do do it right i need to have a robo for it right even though it is an electronic uh, instrument so so we need to 
so we are also actually we are also hired for what we are known for what what we are competent enough for so for that you uh, so please you also try to put as i said in the previous uh, slides put those things these, um, these are a few examples which which you can think of like flexibility dedication and all those things and for all if you have just for example if you have put that i am i am very very creative and so be, please be prepared an example for it so the interviewer might also ask because uh, can you please tell me how that how you are creative so for that please prepare with a formula mantra of star which is called as uh, you need to explain the situation and what was the task which you did uh, i mean that it was there and what are the actions you have taken and what was the result just for example i would just like to give an a give an example you are just doing a, a ph check of an inst uh, of an solution unfortunately the ph probe um, actually have uh, broken so what can you do but you have to continue your work right so so what action i can take is i can i can use a ph probe uh, so the ph strip to just to check the ph and, and and to adjust the ph or else i can also add some phenolphthalein droplets and then titrate it and then uh, until i get a pink color i can actually titrate it if if i want to neutralize the solution so that's where so that is your creativity or the troubleshooting part comes so have those things right and the next is the most important i think uh, the speaker can you also touch upon this grammatical mistakes and also spelling mistakes yeah i have seen a resume where for career objectives they have written career objectives right uh to see it looks very simple but if they are not critical in making the resumes how can i how can a manager can expect that they will be critical in their work yeah and then avoid short forms using in your resumes and don't use funny emails okay enough if uh, yes you might have created your your emails when you are in college or when you are in schools yeah but don't continue that for your professional thing always try to keep it professional way yeah uh, and in your resumes try to avoid putting i i can handle this i can i can do this i have done this rather than the um, what are the competence i have hplc this one gc uh, all those things you can actually include rather than writing i in this and uh, when you are making making resumes please keep on updating your resumes also based on the job requirements say if there is a job uh, opening in a molecular biology lab which needs um, uh, tissue culture handling or the cell culture handling i cannot uh, put uh my the top listed uh, uh, the instruments like i can handle mass spec i can handle gas chromatography because that doesn't because the company doesn't need that yeah they we know that that handling those instrument is very good but the company at that point of time they don't need that you would have also worked on those in the cell culture lines but if you are putting into the third or fourth or next priority so that doesn't catch the eyes of the um, the interviewer or the selection panel so try to update it or review your resume accordingly and then send it to the companies where you are applying yeah and um, one very clear thing is career objectives and also the cover letters are also as important as your technical skills they also hold a very crucial um, points actually so spend some time thinking that what are the career objectives you can actually put it so when when i read a career objective of an uh, person so i i also look that okay what he can give me what he is expecting from me what we can good uh, what we both get together so uh, just think on those things when you are writing uh, an objectives and uh, the cover letter which usually is a snapshot of the whole of your career and uh, why you are applying for a job which which you cannot write it in your resume but in the covering letter you can always say that okay you you saw this ad in the website and these are the things uh, the jd the job roles which which is expected and i do actually match in all these cons uh, aspects yeah 
that so that is a very good uh, uh, so these are things which you have to look for and uh, here why specifically i have written as features because you are branding yourself okay just for example when you are buying a mobile if a person is very keen on uh, taking uh, only the photos for him uh, uh, how good is the uh, um, fastness of the mobile doesn't matter for him the storage and also the camera clarity matters okay so that is what so uh, you have to understand where so what are the different things which usually they look for is a skill set so what the skills you have and does it match their job role yeah and what is a power and i mean that what is here the power is not about the uh, physical strength or what you have with respect to your uh, knowledge what is the knowledge power you have so what is the uh, do you you are also good at this and over this how what good you are like both the non technical and also tech, I mean, the technical things as in power pack comes comes here into the picture and then what are the different competencies here the one is a skill set whatever the lab lab work what do you have and 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 another the different competencies which you have like do you have add on competencies which is not mentioned in the jd job work. yeah job description sorry and then nowadays the teamwork how how you gel with with the, actually the teamwork because uh, every time the as an individual performer i can actually perform better but as a team i might not be because uh, when you want to run a project it is a team effort it is not an individual effort right so we also uh, so the company also looks at how you fit, in, fit into the team how you actually gel and what is the motivation level and so are you self motivated and or all you can also motivate others that also matters and and there is a communication that has big um the crux of most of the things so even though you can you can you can generate lot of data even in the research also you may generate lot of data but if you are not communicating or publishing a paper at the right time uh, you might lose the opportunity so it is the same thing here also yeah so what you have done what you have you need to communicate to other people yeah and also how responsibility how how responsible you are yeah and then how supportive you are are you are you supportive to others have you actually have su supported and then the acceptance to change okay this is a era where every second changes right now the work style because for example if you just see before this covid situation there were a lot of companies we were they were not even giving work from home to the people they were just telling them no you have to come to the office uh, to just to get the 100% um, uh, effort or the uh, opportunity or the extraction of the work from them right now the, what are the job role which we have thought can never happen uh from home or from remote uh, places that has proved that it has we can do the work from option and i feel over a long term i think the our the style of work which which we are doing two years before that will surely change over time even though after post covid also i see lot of things might be work from home where you actually sit somewhere and then do it until and as you are really needed in in those job roles and acceptance of change is also like if you are given a task how you uh, unlearn the things prefer, which you have learned before and then learn it faster unlearning and the, that learning comes also into the picture okay so after this this, this is the last slide which i am presenting to you guys so this is this is the overall tips and tricks so when you are applying for a job the first thing is a job description uh the moment you see a job ad in your um, in your email or in your website please check the job description that do you really fit into the job role okay if you if you fit into the job role you can always apply and the chances of getting the job or chances of getting the interview is high yeah and once you once you have applied and uh, and and also research on the company culture and about the company because in most of the cases when you are applying you should know that what what the company is doing 
and uh, there might be also chances that the company might all the interviewer might also ask you that what do you know about our our company at least you you should know what is the turnover what they do what what they work upon what do they have uh, some of the catchy this one taglines or all those stuff and where are they based at and focus on company needs this what i this is what i i mean if the job role says that you need this uh, this much of requirements and i we are looking for the for the people for the lab work and who can hold who, who can ha handle the analytical instruments like so 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 and so if you know that please try please prioritize those things and put it in your skill set on um, on the first first few uh, first few job skill uh, skills so that it it catches the interviewer's uh, eyes yeah and uh, another thing is uh, the usually the mistake says i would have updated my resume 2 years before and i have just blindly sent sent to that right now i uh, so whatever i would have written in that i would i would not know and uh, in, if the questions will might come by seeing the resumes then i will be in a state where i am not able to answer it so get familiar about your own resume so at least you should know where what things you have just put it in which section yeah and be clear and concise in your answers as an interviewer i i expect only three to four sentences for one question and uh, no beating around the bush if you know things please yes and if you don't know things there is no harm in saying no and most of the interviewers actually appreciate those things because if you don't know please please just tell no because the moment you just uh, tell the things which you don't know like if i just ask you uh, which is the enzyme uh, which acts on starch if you just tell uh, it is in hydrolysis enzyme i don't know then again he will just tell okay what is an hydrolysis enzyme so it actually the interviewer it 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 is a chain reaction so once you fall it's it is better that you just tell okay i i am falling rather than uh, keep on falling on the same question right right and uh, as i said in my previous uh, slides prepare prepare examples of your past success and also ac accomplishment and whatever it is in your resume and first impression is the last impression so this is about the dressing sense and how you look how you project yourself because after the resume this is the second place where you are getting projected so uh, so uh, well dressed i mean that according to the uh, job role yeah next is a ice break up find a point which actually find a point where it is actually common to the interview actually as you have access to the linkedin profile and you, if you have got a mail saying that you you are getting interviewed i am pretty sure you are actually uh told that these are the things uh, i mean that he is an interviewer then you can actually hello i think something happening with my laptop yeah sorry uh, so find a common point say, say that okay the interviewer is from uh is from biochemistry background and and you are also biochemistry background then then you can you can tell you sir i am also from from biochemistry or he or he is also from the same hometown so that actually helps you in uh, building a rapport with the so with the interviewer but it's not like that you are you are you are taking the chances there or anything else but it is just a icebreaker yeah and show excitement in for the job role if they just ask that what do you feel about this job you should be you should show that you have done some research and these are the things you can actually do for it and don't fall on the most common um, uh common mistake so just go to the website and just search that what on those things you can you can actually uh what uh, are the common uh, ask questions uh, um, the, during the interview and then try to have a ready made answer for that and confident body and a good gesture like a firm handshake for example or eye to eye contact might be and be prepared for a closing statement just like you are thanking the interviewer for example just you are thanking the interviewer for uh, to show the gratitude and for his time and also the interest on the on your resume uh, so this is an overall picture uh, and other the best thing is after all this uh, if you are following it up is also the main one best thing which you, which you can actually do it so if you have got a call and if you have the email address it's always better after a week 
you can also drop a mail to them saying that can you sir uh, you can also uh, sir what happened to my email or if you have a if the it is a telephonic uh, interview you can always tell that um, uh, what happened but all, always on time i mean that, that doesn't mean that you actually um, call them on sundays so it's always on the working time because usually i have seen that as a gap yeah so after this i i, uh, I would like to close my uh, the presentation and once again i would like to thank uh, jcc institute and also this webinar uh, organizers for giving this opportunity and i'd like to uh, wish a uh, good luck to all the students yeah thank you thank, thank you uh, asha it was uh, indeed a nice presentation thank you so much uh, for presenting and uh, i know it is already late uh, uh, we are i apologize for that all the uh, guests uh, chief guests and also invitees and uh, the participants i'm sorry and now uh, uh, like to welcome you all uh, for the uh, the final session it is valedictory so i request uh, dr uh, k ravisha uh, to deliver welcome speech uh, very good afternoon to one and all my pranams to the holy feet of his holiness and invoking the blessings of his holiness i stand before you for welcoming the dignitaries to the valedictory function of this international uh, webinar it has been a tough time carrying through for the because of the pandemic and as rightly said by the pro chancellor in the inaugural address this is the time This is the first uh, webinar that we are doing during the lockdown. Friends, at the outset, I would like to welcome our beloved registrar, Dr. B. Manjunath, who has been a great supporter of Faculty of Life Sciences for the development. And if at all, all these developments have taken place in the la last few years, it is because of the total support of the management and the authorities of JSSA, HCA. of which he is one among the most important officers sir in spite of uh, busy schedule he has joined us in spite of it being a holiday thank you very much sir for having joined i will i warmly welcome you on behalf of the staff and students of the faculty of life sciences thank you sir thank you very much sir i also extend a very warm welcome to the director of academics who has be who has accepted to be the chief guest of the today's function dr p a kushalappa a highly unassuming fellow who has been able to be almost with us for the, the, all the development activities that's going on in the faculty of life sciences and thank you very much sir for having joined in spite of the busy schedule a warm welcome to you sir my pleasure sir thank you and one most important is our guest guest of honor is our beloved i would i would like to call him as the host even though we have put him as the guest of honor he is the architect of uh, faculty of life sciences a great visionary for the development of faculty of life sciences the founder of uh, faculty of life sciences he is our beloved dean faculty of life sciences dr bala subramanian in spite of his busy schedule he has joined thank you very much sir for joining a warm welcome to you sir i also heartily welcome all the participants and the panelists of the valedictory function a warm welcome to all the participants and the panelists i also would like to welcome our the cio and his team the technical team for all the support and i take it uh, this opportunity to also thank him on this behalf uh, of faculty of life sciences but for whose uh, total support the webinar would not have been a great success thank you one and all i again welcome all those who are directly or indirectly participating all the participants parents of the participants and also the panelists teaching and non teaching staff faculty of life sciences A warm welcome to you all. Thank you, Varenda. Dr. Siddesh, please go ahead.
so thank you very much sir uh, for the welcome speech uh, now i would uh, request dr balasubramanian yes dean fls director research uh, to address the gathering uh, uh, thank you very much uh, sitesh i am audible yes sir you are audible sir thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity i am happy to participate in the validity function of the webinar i thank the participants and the panel members for successfully conduct the webinar i thank the division of biochemistry faculty dr jr kumar dr ravram achar and sudesh and hod ravisha for organizing the webinar and also thank the university authorities for permitting the same and the ceo ceo uh, office for supporting the same for the seminar in india i will take one or two time uh, minutes in india the education the previous education before our uh, colonial rule is very good now it is uh, changed because the uh, everybody knows i think most of you knows that uh, life and letters of lord mccallay who came and spoiled our education system in india he wrote in his book that uh, the uh, backbone of indian education we, once we broke the backbone of indian education then only we will get uh, we will make them under our control otherwise it will not be happen it is happened and our entire education olden system historical education system is changed <laughs> they are ready to produce only clerks to the government not uh, as a educated person they made it like that earlier system is education is very good and they made it as a passion yeah i will put it like this education is not a preparation for life but education is life itself education in india has many community advantage education and low cost the second advantage is the uh, high diversity of different matters the diversity of education in south india is different from north india and western india and uh, southeast uh, india it is uh, different from one place to another place and the uh, education in south india is uh, especially in karnataka the jss institutions play a vital role i feel much pride saying the for this um, our uh, uh, for this we vow to debt in debt our uh, gratitude the vision and foresight of our uh, present swami ji and the earlier swami ji dr now is chancellor of the establishment of many institutions of higher learning in india and abroad you know we have uh, uh, for your information i am saying we have institution at mauritius usa and dubai i feel much pride in saying that the pro chancellor dr p suresh have taken various steps for improving the quality of education and research by increasing allocation of fund in jss system today the launching pad for huge investment in higher education both qualitative and incomes is ready that i uh, we already started a university in mauritius the second university in north india is almost we have to receive the order the third progress is we are going to dubai for a uh, third uh, third university we are starting uh, both point uh, as well need is concrete directed action is required that is the authorities of the universities are doing a concrete action and jss is the base all these education needs of south india and, and the admission in jss system from foreign student is uh, not very much remarkable but it is uh, improving in day by day this clearly suggest that jss is increasingly becoming a prepared destination for foreign students and many more would come to india in the coming years leading to healthy inter exchange students peoples and ideas
in our faculty of life science we have many foreign students from african countries and southeast uh, southwest uh, uh, indian countries yeah? but uh, the number is now slowly coming down again we have to improve the number if it is going in this direction in this direction under the public private partnership framework which dramatically increase our higher education capabilities the jss system is try to increase the higher education capability in india especially in south india particularly in karnataka if it is happened then the uh, uh, higher education capability in uh, of the, uh, in india it will increase with this few words i thank the authorities for giving me a chance to uh, for the joining the valid technology thank you very much thank you. thank you thank you very much sir for your uh, uh, kind words and also information on uh, jss and uh, uh, jss impact in india and abroad thank you sir and next uh, it's it's my pleasure to invite dr p a kushalappa sir uh, director academics jss i have to address and to give valedictory address thank you sir please welcome thank you thank you uh, dr sidesh am i audible yes sir audible yeah. sir yeah uh, seeking the blessings of his holiness uh, swami ji chancellor of uh, jss academy of higher education and research i am uh, pleased to address the participants of the international webinar a career catalyst plan prepare and prosper in life sciences this has been organized by the division of uh, biochemistry faculty of life sciences and is a much needed and thoughtful webinar first of all i thank you for having uh, me as the uh, chief guest here and to give you uh, a few of my uh, time few minutes of my time and uh, first of all my heartfelt appreciation to the organizing team of uh, dr siddesha along with dr kumar and dr raghura machar with the advice of the dean dr balasubramanian and uh, the head of fls dr ravisha i also warmly appreciate the efforts the resource persons have put to give you valuable advice and you have learned how you can succeed in any career you choose i acknowledge the valuable advice and support from the pro chancellor the vice chancellor and registrar and i personally am always available to the faculty of life sciences at any time i am sure this webinar has made you proud to have joined the various life sciences programs and also in these times of the pandemic for you to have conducted an international webinar is a commendable thing and i congratulate you again now having heard a few of the speakers yesterday and today i am sure that the participants have benefited immensely from the advice and suggestions given by the various speakers you all have chosen a valuable course in joining the life sciences and your participation and help to the health sector is no less valuable doctors nurses and the other staff in hospitals need all the support which life sciences can give be it in tracing the cause of an epidemic or like in the present case the pandemic or in evolving methods to control it the studies and research you do in biochemistry microbiology nanotechnology and so on and so forth among the life sciences goes a long way in helping the doctors understanding new infections and how to control them you are the silent and unsung heroes whose contribution to the war on viruses and bacteria is immense and i i am sure you understand what a vital role you can play in any war on a biological war infection control of the infection this webinar has shown you the importance and value in joining the life sciences fraternity and how to get further in the field both here in india and abroad i have been listening how valuably uh, how, uh, how much valuable information is given how to 
apply for some uh, job prospects abroad, how to do research abroad, and also how to face an interview and how to prepare a CV. Everything was uh, uh, given here and it is a wonderful uh, effort from all the resource persons. So with these few words, I wish you all the best. Stay safe in these difficult times. The war will soon be over. God bless you all. And thank you again to the organizers for having invited me. And I can see that even 160 participants are uh, still there, which is a wonderful figure for a valedictory function on a Sunday afternoon. Congratulations to the organizing team. And uh, God bless you all. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your kind words and uh, briefing uh, the overall uh, in, uh, webinar about the career cases and prepare and prosper in life. So thank you so much. And uh, next, I request Dr. Manjanatha B. HR to give a presidential address. Welcome, sir, please. Thank you. I'm seeking the blessings of His Holiness. I think uh, it's a pleasant occasion. The Pro Chancellor address yesterday set the ball sailing. And uh, I would like to thank all the resource persons. I can see the feedback here. They are all excellent. They are thanking you for your uh, patience. And uh, almost all their doubts are clear. And uh, further, your uh, emails have also been provided. I think uh, the participants are very lucky to be with this uh, in this uh, webinar. I would request our uh, dean and the head to conduct more such webinars till this pandemic is uh, there. I think in a couple of months, if you are lucky enough, I think we can have a seminar or an international seminar offline. That is in on our campus. I would request all of you to come to Mysore and attend the seminar there. And uh, here we are lucky to have both health sciences and life sciences side by side. So this unique experience will uh, also have this. And I would request you to go through our website and see the various courses available, various opportunities available, online courses available, which we are going to increase. And make use of uh, the facilities here. I would like to thank all the organizers for organizing such an excellent uh, webinar. And once again, thank the uh, participants and in particular, the resource persons for their inputs and patience. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, uh, addressing the participants and all of us. Thank you so much. Now I request uh, Dr. J.R. Kumar to give a vote of thanks. Sir, Kumar, sir, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Siddesh. Um, with the blessings of His Holiness, Sri Jagadguru Sri Deshikendra Mahaswamiji, Chancellor, JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research, Mysuru and Sutturu Guru Parampara. It has been our great pleasure to host the participants of international webinar on career catalyst and life sciences at JSSCHER. I am very much thankful to beloved Pro Chancellor, Dr. B. Suresh Sir, JSSCHER, for a continuous support uh, and advisors which have great help towards the successful international webinar and its inspiring leadership. And also, I wish to express my great gratitude to Vice Chancellor B. Surinder Singh for providing a constant encouragement and guidance throughout the, the international webinar. My thanks, heartfelt thanks to my to registrar, Dr. B. Manjunatha, uh, for his constant support and encouragement throughout the webinar, both well directory and inauguration. I sincere thanks to go to my uh, director research, Dean, Faculty of Life Sciences, Dr. Balasubramanian, sir, for his valuable suggestion and guidance throughout the webinar um, in the uh, international webinar. Again, I thank um, our beloved uh, academic director, Dr. Shana Pasar, 
for his valuable suggestion um, in the international throughout the webinar. I extend my thanks uh, to Dr. Uh, Ravisha, head of the department, uh, Faculty of Life Sciences, for their enormous cooperation in organizing the event. And also, I thank to uh, JSSCHR administration and also the IT section, especially the Ravindra sir and Dhananjay sir, um, to providing us all possible support towards the organizing this event and it make it successful. The participants are very enthusiastic and also I'm thankful to all the participants and coming to JCHR um, online webinar to attend, the, attend this event. We have been uh, fortunate to have some eminent person from academia, industry, and working in the area of, of life sciences. And also I thank uh, to our own people um, uh, giving their own precious time in organizing um, this uh, international webinar Dr. Siddesha, Dr. Raghuram Achan, Assistant Professor Dujana Biochemistry. And also I thank all my faculty members and also the administrative part of our life sciences. They help in, in our every part of during the preparation of this international webinar. So uh, thank you very much. Sir, uh, thank you for the word of thanks. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Jair Kumar, uh, Course Coordinator, Division of Biochemistry, FLS, JSS, JSS HR. And also, uh, last but not least, I would like to thank students. I would like to thank our students, FLS students, BSc, MSc, all the courses. And also, because some of them helped us, some of them helped us in you know, public, pub, publicizing it. And also, I would like to uh, thank all the faculties, um, you know, in uh, FLS de uh, department. And also, I would like to thank press and media, actually, who also published our uh, uh, press release like uh, about the uh, webinar. So I thank all of you. I thank the officers, higher authorities, including uh, pro chancellor, vice chancellor, registrar, and everyone, everyone, uh, sir, Kusalapa, sir, and um, Balu, Balu Burunin, sir, uh, Ravisha, sir, for his support and uh, guidance. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, all of you, participants, and the invited speakers. Thank you all. And uh, with this, uh, we, could, we can conclude. Thank you so much. I think, mm -hmm. sir, can we conclude, sir? Please. Well done. Well done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. All the